right, welcome to The Hang, everybody. This is a very special virtual edition of The Hang. Uh, we're not at Boston Sack Shop today. We are on the interwebs, connecting with some very special, esteemed guests here. Uh, but first, I want to introduce my co-host. That's Dave Pollack. Say hi, Dave. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to The Hang today. What's going on, You're Ryan? Right. How you feeling? Oh, man, I'm feeling fantastic. The weather is warming up here in Boston. It's like 50 degrees today and not like 35, Ooh. so... Really happy about that. Uh, so I'm feeling I'm feeling good, but I'm I'm the most excited because of our guest today. We have the most recorded and most selling saxophone player of all time, Mr. Kenny G. Let's welcome. Hi guys, him. Well, thank you for that Woo-hoo. intro. Appreciate that, Ryan, Dave. Yeah. Good to see you. Um, you know, I wish we were in person, but this is this works though. I'm in LA right now, so. How cool is it that we can just talk to each other like this? I'm, you know, you guys are young. You're used to this technology. Every time I do a Zoom call, I always think, this is amazing. It is amazing, especially, you know, over the last four years or so uh, where we kind of had to do it. So everybody got kind of thrust into this and it was, uh, you know, so the fact that we can now use it for good going forward um, for just distance purposes and things, it's it's awesome. I liked it right from the beginning uh, because... I literally don't really like to go out that much. I mean, you know, I'm on the road a lot and I perform a lot and I've, I'm a, I have a busy life. So the less I have to go and take my physical body and be in a room to talk to somebody, but we can still do it like this. That was so it was basically life-changing for me and in, in such a good way. And, uh, but I like, I love it. I, um, you know, I'm doing cameo too. So that's kind of like, this same kind of format and i just thought wow what a what great ideas these are dave you got a cameo from like your students of kenny right i did it was actually right before we went up to that boston show and we got we were hanging out and stuff right before that i was leaving um now my previous uh teaching job at middle school and they got me a going away in eighth grade all the eighth graders chipped in and got me a going away cameo and you played and it was like and it was the craziest thing ever. It was so amazing. And then we <laughs> happened to be up there a couple like weeks later. So it was amazing. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> well, I hope it was a good cameo. I mean, oh, it was also, incredible. Now, now I feel bad. I don't want eighth graders chipping in to pay me. I don't I didn't need their money. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were they were happy to. And I was I was blown away. But and you played on it too. And they sat me down in a room and projected it like they were all around. Oh, it was like it was so good. Yeah, it was oh, great. Oh, that's so cool. That's so yeah. cool. And and the, the sax sounded okay on the oh it was on great. The cameo? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I always go. I always worry about the you know the quality because it's I'm doing it on my iPhone, and I I try to find the best, you know, depending on where I am. If I'm at home, I can I can dial in the sound here. Yeah, you were in the studio. I was in the studio. Oh, great. Yeah, then I know. Yeah, good. Uh, on the road, sometimes you know I'm. Uh, I want. I have. I have to get it done. I have to find a place. And some of the backstage, as you guys know, because you guys have done plenty of gigs, sometimes the backstage rooms are just awful for sound, and so you know I try to find. Even if I have to go into a stairwell just to get a little bit of ambiance for the sax. He's not phoning it in. He's no. dedicated. No. Dedicated to the to the product. Really, the I am. Phoning, I'm using my phone. But yeah, every time I place something that I know is going to be heard by somebody, I want it to be absolutely the best that I can possibly do. So it's a, even the cameos, like, I mean, most of them I can just do. But there's some that, man, I might take it. Might, I might, might take seven or eight takes on a cameo just because I didn't like like one of the notes I played on this little, my, my own melody is like, God, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like that one for some reason. So I, and I just do it over until I think it's really great. That's, that's dedicated to quality right there. And that's why you are who you are. I, you know, um, I think so. You know, yeah. I, I do think so. Yeah. And, and I don't say that to be, pat myself on the back. I'm, I'm saying that every time I've made a record and every, um, when I had control, like, mm-hmm. like so I've made like 20 records so far, tw- maybe 22 or whatever it is, if you count best ofs and compilations. But I think I made 20 s- different albums. And the first three, I didn't really have much control over in terms of how they went down. Because I had a, I was working with the producer, you know, like when mm-hmm. I got my record deal with Clive Davis, it was just because I was playing with Jeff Lorber's band. I don't know if you guys know who Jeff Lorber is, but... Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, he was like, he was the fusion guy back in... The, the 80s, like just mm-hmm. late 70s, early 80s. So he was out of Portland, Oregon. So before all this great technology, we had nothing. We had no phones, no computers, no internet. Uh, I had a landline at my mom's house 
I mean, that was at my parents' house. So one day it rings, you know, I'm going, hello. And he, hey, this is Jeff Lorber. I, mean, I don't know who you are. How would I know you? I'm thinking to myself. I said, uh, yeah. He goes, listen, I have a band. I'm looking for a sax player. I hear you're a pretty good sax player. I said, cool. Um, tell me more. And so I find out that he's in Portland, Oregon. And then I run down to the record store to find out who this Jeff Lorber is because he says he makes records and he's a recording artist. So I go down there and they find a Jeff Lorber record. So it's a big record. And I take it home and put it on a record player and I play it. And I went, I really like this. Is This is music's really cool. Like he's, he can play. He's a good player. And I think maybe I can learn something. And so I drove to Portland to audition for the group and I got the, I got the gig. That's how I, that's how it all started for me becoming a recording artist. Wow. Just off of a landline phone call. <laughs> that's that's crazy. I know. And and the reason that he had heard about me was because in <clears throat> Seattle, um, so I went to the university. Well, first I went to Franklin High School. I, my first gig was playing with Barry White, which was the coolest thing, you know. So I don't know if you know who Barry White is, but he was the like he was the biggest male black R and B singer in the world in 1974. What happened was that we had a, a high school a, a band, a jazz band, and we we won like the the U.S. competitions like for three years. The three years I was there, we won. I'm not saying it was because of me. I'm saying we won, and I was there. So, the the band director had a relationship with somebody, and they were trying to find a sax player that could sit in for Barry White's sax player that wasn't going to make the gig. And the th requirements was they needed somebody that had somewhat of a soulful sound, but he also had to read music. And there was this one kid in the high school band that could do both, which was me. And so I got the gig. Wow. And because of that, wow. I started doing more gigs in Seattle. And that's how Jeff Lorber heard my name, you know, all the way in Portland, Oregon. So there you go. There's there's a little history. Not that you even asked. I just. <laughs> oh, listen, <laughs> no, we love it. Stuff. We love it. You know, I mean, the hang, if people so. are watching there, you know, they may they may or may not know my music or, or my name. But now you at least, you know, kind of like, how did I get started becoming somewhat known and it wasn't that wasn't even my goal was to become somewhat known my goal was just to keep pra practicing and getting better and playing gigs and trying to do my best and just whatever happens happens that that's so interesting that you say that about you back in high school because i distinctly remember when we were up in boston you say to this day your favorite thing is that you get to you get to not you have to you get to play your saxophone and practice every day you love it you love practicing still. You love just making music. And even if it's music that no one's ever going to hear, you know, just working out a line or that's, Dude. you know, that's awesome. I love well, it. You know, listen, I, I'm, I, as I, as I scroll on the internet and I see guys like Ryan, you know, playing <laughs> out all those crazy notes, I was like, okay, I want to understand. So I saw like slow it down and, and actually I don't slow it down, but I'll just, just put it on my uh, recorder and I'll learn. So I, I might want to learn a lick or two. Every day I try to learn something new from all these amazing sax players that are out there. It's like, this is, you guys are ridiculous, by the way. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's so great. It's inspiring to me. So, yeah. So there's something for me to practice every day. I, I did put my three hours in this morning. Wow. Like yesterday, like I did the day before, like I did all year and the 10 years and the 30 and the 40 years before. Wow. So every morning it's like, I honestly am super psyched to wake, to get out of bed. I can't wait to start my practice session because I'm That's determined amazing. like that day I'm determined that I'm going to get my tongue in the way I want it. I'm going to get my phrase in the way I want it. <laughs> I'm going to do this the way I want it. And of course I never can. <laughs> so then the next day it's like, okay, this is the day. And the next day, this is the day. And then every now and then um, I'll play something that's really, really get really good. And then I'll go, Hey, I have this. And then I, as you, as you know, like when you get like a, a lick or, or a phrase that you, that you've always wanted to play or you like the way it sounds and that becomes part of your repertoire and you just stick that in your pocket and you know you could always play it perfectly anytime you want to that's a good feeling oh yeah absolutely I mean, you can't play all those wrong notes ryan without knowing <laughs> how to play them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah this is true i love that this is true there's there's, I mean, some, there's i think it's very very funny how you you uh you talk about yourself playing like wrong all the wrong new notes but it's those are those are great notes and wrong that. notes only <laughs> Wrong notes only, yeah. And just the phrasing and um, the tonguing, like I've talked to you before about your tonguing, is like really impressive, man. Really impressive. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know how I kind of came about that. I think uh, 
you know, I got to study for two years with Jerry Berganzi at New England Conservatory, uh, which was an incredible oh, yeah. experience. And, uh, you know, he was super into like, you know, having me kind of conceptualize playing things in a different way than what I was doing before. And uh, one of the exercises he had me do was like, he's like, I just want you to play what you think is wrong. Like, just play the wrong notes, you know? Wow. And uh, it was interesting because it like completely opened up my brain to like playing things that I normally wouldn't do. You know, I was just trying to improvise freely on the spot. And uh, so that's kind of where the the practicing, the academic sort of thing came from wrong notes only. But we also had, Dave and I did a gig together in Philadelphia that was live streamed on the internet. And some guy watched it and sent us a two-page critique of the gig. Like every song, he like critiqued us. <laughs> and one of the critiques was the tighter player t plays too many wrong notes. And then so I was like, I got to run with this now. I mean, this is hilarious, oh. you know? So, that, that was done, that that critique was that was a while ago. That wasn't recent. No, no, this is like three, four years ago now, something like that. Oh. Yeah. How would you How would you have received this two page critique? Where was it? Email. Yeah, he emailed a, an it email to Dave. with a two page word document. <laughs> okay, but sent to you personally or sent somewhere? And how would they have your email address? So nobody, you somebody you don't know, right? Yes, it's. I mean, it's on the internet from from different things and either business things or whatever, but. They, you know, he just sent me the mess. He was like, hey, Dave, uh, you know, I just, I watched the, and by the way, he watched it online, the entire thing. Apparently he hated the entire thing, but watched it for, you know, two and a half hours. Two course. sets, two sets. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And had like a paragraph on each one. Oh, and he, he didn't, uh, let me see, how do I put this? He didn't love Ryan's approach <laughs> <laughs> too <laughs> much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How was yours, Dave? Was, was your, was your critique uh, of uh, he, it was like back more backhanded compliments. I forget yeah. exactly what he said. It was like, "Hey, I could tell you've listened to other people. Now maybe try to do something original or something like that." Something like, like that. Oh. Yeah. It's like, man. All right. Okay. Yeah, so this is this is um this is one of the downsides of uh downsides of of the the technology we have is that everybody uh there's so many people that have opinions and I my philosophy has always been there's no way that I would have ever heard from this guy about me without this. So I think, so then I just think that, that I don't think I need to pay any attention to it. So that's why I never pay attention to that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. if one of my good friends decides they want to tell me something, that's even, that's even crossing the line a little bit mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. I, like, you know, like I really don't want any critique. Don't really want any critique. I'm, I, I can critique myself pretty well. And you see, I wouldn't pay one. I wouldn't have paid any attention to that two page thing. I would have probably read one line and went, just delete. I would have probably not even read it. <laughs> well, we actually, we, I, because you know, I've done some other videos online which garnered some people. The purists, the jazz police, which I we do want to get into with you in a minute. Sure. But the jazz police didn't love. So what I usually do is I turn it around and we make jokes out of it. So me and Ryan actually had a Zoom call where we just went through it like line by line, and we like and agreed like, with him. Yeah, we yeah. start. We're like, you know what? You're right, and blah blah. And it was, uh, and people loved <laughs> yeah. it. So, yeah, know, we had a good time with it. It's always yeah. good to 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 critique yourself. I I think. That's, oh yeah. You don't, you don't want to take yourself too seriously. There, you know. No, totally. We're all we're all trying to. Every sax player out there, or horn player, we're all just trying to play a grade and come up with stuff that's that's new and and wonderful. It's not it's not easy. So we're everybody's trying their best. Yeah. yeah. You know, at least you, you hope so. You hope so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think like something that I, I look up to you for, and I tell a lot of my students about is the way that you handle you like the quote unquote jazz police and stuff like that, you know, like whatever it is, but I'd love to hear maybe some more of your own words on your thoughts on it and how it, I mean, I, I think by just listening to you now, it doesn't affect you at all, but did it ever affect you? And how do you go about navigating that mentally? Yeah, good question. Um, no, it never affected me. No, not not for one second, which is good because I saved myself a lot of the anxiety. Yeah, a lot because you know if I would have listened to some of the things that I read about me by some of the quote jazz police, whoever they are, yeah. um, you know, I probably would have maybe maybe I would have tried to play differently. I would have, I would have maybe tried to learn more traditional sax things. I may be more standards. I maybe I would have, 
I don't know. Maybe I would have tried to write music differently, but that would have all been for my ego wanting to please these people more than what my heart and soul wanted to do musically. So I always, I always really have um, just played things that I, that sound good to me. That's really how it is for me. I'm not a. I didn't go to music school, so I'm not a music major. I'm an accounting major, uh, actually. So wow. I did play in my my college band. I played in my college um, jazz band. It was led by a guy named Roy Cummings. And Roy Cummings, I'll get to the. I'm, I haven't forgotten about the jazz police, but Roy Cummings, you know, may he rest in peace, was the guy that conducted the um, the jazz band. But he was also the the contractor in Seattle for all the gigs. So like. For example, wow. Liberace and Sammy Davis Jr. would come to town and they need a, you know, a horn section. So he always singled me out of the out of the band, the the, the the college band. And he said, hey, listen, I I I I think you can you can do these gigs. I said, I know I can do these gigs. He said, great. So I would always wow. play uh, play in all those things. So I never that was my music class in high school in in college. Never, never took theory, never did anything, never studied it. Wow. Uh, but what I did was I listened. So when I listened to a John Coltrane solo, like um, before people had transcribed giant steps and handed it to the young students on a silver platter, like it is today, <laughs> I wrote out those all those notes, listening with my ears, and, and I could play that. And I thought, well, that's a nice exercise for me. It was an exercise, but it wasn't, it didn't do anything for me in terms of what I wanted to do with my sound and my creativity. Mm -hmm. But I liked it. And so, but, but there was, you know, there's a couple of licks I took from that solo and they're part of my repertoire, you know, and I listened to lots of people and from, you know, from miles to Dexter Gordon. And I listened a lot to Sonny Rollins and there would be licks that I would take. So I knew how to play those things. And so I'm thinking, okay, the jazz police, you are just i think they're i i kind of looked at them like they're not happy that i'm selling a lot of records you know they're not listening to what i'm playing because if they would listen to it they would hear that the notes i'm playing sound really good with the chords that are there and the solos i've done they could listen and go okay there's some legit notes in there you know but they don't want to hear that they 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 don't they don't hear it all they hear is whatever they just think of me as a pop guy that's i may be somehow turned his back on traditional jazz to make money i mean that's kind of the that was kind of the philosophy and mm. my answer to that is if i was only that smart i mean <laughs> there's no way to do that there's no way to do that what i yeah. did was i played music that sounded good to me and i played the notes that sounded good to me in the way that sounded good to me and lucky for me um, there's a lot of people in the world that decided that they liked that. Now they could have easily said, you know, we don't like this at all. I don't like the sound that you get and these notes that you're playing and the music that you're writing. Yeah, they could have done that, but they didn't. And so that was great for me because it allowed me to keep going. Um, so yeah, and and also I've got lots of other um, scar tissue that keeps me really strong against the jazz police. Like for example. When I opened up for Miles Davis for you know many many gigs, so I I was there um, playing to his audience who thought I was great. Um, I watched his show many many times, and uh, one night we were playing at Lincoln Center at uh, wherever the, the big concert hall. And in between sets, he comes into my dressing room and he tells me that he likes my song Songbird, that big song that I had back then. That he goes, and he was something like, Amen. That song you played that the ladies like, I like it. Sounds great, man. Keep doing it. Something like that. That's him talking to me. So wow. I'm thinking, okay, so there's a jazz critic that writes in a paper that doesn't really like what, I, what I'm what i doing and wants to just trash me on paper. But yet there's Miles Davis, who is, on, you know, he's, he's like royalty, right? You know, he comes yeah. in, he tells me that's what I'm playing. Okay, so let me see. What should I listen to? Hmm, I can't, I don't know. So then I think about that, um, you know, George Benson, when, uh, we, I was his, we were playing a co-bill. This was maybe, uh, well, I did, I did some gigs with him May, you know, 25 years ago or more, 30 years ago. But recently, like in the last five or six years, we played a gig together and he came into my dressing room when I was practicing, which I hate. 
I hate it when anyone knocks on my door when I'm practicing. Because on the road, I practice in the afternoon. And everybody in my organization knows when I'm practicing, leave me alone. Mm. It's going to be two hours. It'll be three hours. Just leave me alone. When I come out of the room, there you go. So there's a knock on the door and I'm pissed that somebody's knocking at my door. So I'm kind of answer it rudely and I open the door and it's George Benson. And I'm like, so, you know, immediately the frown went to a smile. George, he goes, hey, brother. Uh, hey, man, I just want to come in and uh, rap with you or something, whatever he says. And he comes in and he's got a glass of wine. And he starts telling me that between me and Coltrane, this is him talking. I'm not, that that we are like the, the best soprano sax he's ever heard in his life. And I said, can, wow. can I record you saying that, please? <laughs> I may yeah. need proof that you actually said that. So you'll have wow. to believe me because I didn't record him. But so those are the moments when I think about worrying about what a, what a jazz player or a jazz critic thinks of me. It's like, bro, come on. You know, wow. it's not. It's, I, I'm good. I'm cool. I'm happy with what I'm doing. Yeah. Now, if I tried to please you, I would have to change everything just because of that. And that's a head trip. And I don't right. think that's the way we should be making our music. I really don't think that, that, you know, if you think about Michael Brecker or Sanborn or Coltrane or my, or Stan Getz, you think that they were worried about what the, maybe, I don't know, maybe they were worried about what the other players think, but I don't know. I don't think so. I think Coltrane just put that horn in his mouth and just did whatever he wanted to do. One of the, what that's incredible. Absolutely. First of all, all that yeah. stuff is like gold. But one of the things I think is so interesting too, when you just say you start changing your sound, those those people who are so vocal about saying they don't like it, they're just gonna change the. They're gonna move the goalpost. They'll be like, "Oh, you play like this now? Well, you're just playing some what someone else did. Then you yeah. do this. Oh, now you're playing like you know. There, there's there is no pleasing those type of people. So it's yeah. great that you know you just figured. No, I'm just gonna play what I like, and that's exactly. That's amazing. You know, and, and and I, I you know, one thing that I, one way I like to think of it is like, okay, so let's say you take two sax players, right? Say one sax player can play, you know, a 500 BPM, the fastest you've ever heard, right? And then that, and then you take another sax player that plays a melody that makes everybody cry. So mm -hmm. which, what's harder? What's harder to do? Now, the jazz police would say, well, the, the guy that plays the fast licks with the perfect technique, because that's way harder. And I say, is it? Is that really? Not that I can't do that. You know, I know I know how what my technique can do. I'm not saying I can't. But I'm just saying if you were to compare, it's like, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of that validity to doing something that moves people. And, and that's something that you just, I, I, I don't want to say you can't, you can't learn it, but it's almost like you can't teach it. It just yeah. happens. Like, how does your heart connect with the notes, and how do you play those notes? Where do you put the vibrato? Where do you do, where do you take the breath? How, what's the reverb sound like? What's the tone? You know, all those things I just did out of my instincts on, on how to play, and it seems to touch people. And so, again, that's another thing for me to think about when somebody's criticizing me about, you know, my my sax playing, or they don't they don't hear enough, you know. Dexter yeah. Gordon and my, my licks. It's like, really? I think Dexter Gordon had enough Dexter Gordon. Right. I don't think anybody else needs any Dexter Gordon. I want to leave that with him and I'm going to do my thing. I mean, when, when I was playing with Miles at the, at the end of his career, when I was opening up, Miles had, there was not one note that reminded me of Miles Davis when he was playing bebop. Not one note. Right. Now, do you think any of the jazz critics went and said, hey, come on, Miles, man, come on. You know, you're not playing enough notes up there. You're just kind of screwing around. Your back's to the audience. You play about six notes. Man, Miles, come on. They, they were just going, oh, isn't he amazing? Isn't he amazing? And I'm thinking, okay, he's decided to do something new that no one's ever done. No one's ever played the way he's playing now. And maybe you don't like it. I, personally, I didn't like it that much. I didn't like the latest Miles. I didn't. But I, I admired the fact that he was doing something brand new that was different and that's what he wanted to do. And he wasn't, I'm sure he was not losing sleep over the fact that he wasn't playing his fast bebop licks anymore. Right, I I'm love that. Saying, I'm just saying there's there's lots of room for everything. There's room for any kind of playing. I mean, I've, listen, I've, I've hung out with, I know we we all revere Michael Brecker, but you know, I've, I've done a few gigs with him. Like I played down at the uh, Nice Jazz Festival, Festival with him. And we played, um, um, I don't know, whatever the day it was. So I played my set, he played his set, whatever, whatever. 
But I, when he was playing his set, I, I was watching him really intently, and he was amazing. He was mm -hmm. amazing. And afterwards, he finished his set, so he came back. You know, we're all kind of hanging in the same dressing room. And he comes back, he goes, man, I sucked. <laughs> and, I, and I looked at him, and I, I said, do you really think so? He goes, oh, man, did you hear whatever? I go, I said, okay, let's, let me just tell you something. I said, as a saxophone player, I watched you so intently. You don't even know how I watched you. I watched your finger. I watched where your lips were. I watched every nuance. And, and I'm, I'm telling you right now, you were phenomenal, Michael Brecker. You were amazing. And it, I, I know it made him feel better. It made him feel better. But what a heavy heart to take. Like, why would he think that? And, and I, I felt bad for him because mm. he was so phenomenal. And he was doing something that he had to sound like nobody else at that point. You know, we all know that he obviously loved John Coltrane. We can hear it. But he took Coltrane and made made his own fusion of whatever he was doing. So the soulful stuff and kind of like Grover Washington Jr. He was soulful, but yet he had some jazz chops. Like Stanley Turrentine would be another example of that. And Bre Brecker was, was le maybe less soulful and more jazzy. But then he went outside like Coltrane was doing when he... When he went just enough outside that where it sounded good, and then he went too far. <laughs> now, now you got my opinions on everything, right there. In that story. <laughs> love it. I love but, that. You know, yeah. Um, so yeah. So the, I'm, what, I guess my point is that Brecker was doing what he thought was great, and maybe he didn't like what he played that night because maybe he imagined he could do better. And I'm sure we we're all the same way, where we leave the the bandstand thinking, "Man, I wish I could do that gig over again." And I know that feeling, but. I don't beat myself up over it because it's a false sense of motivation. Mm. It really is. And I think that, I don't know, you know, I don't think he's doing himself any good by beating himself up. You can acknowledge that you can do better, but if you beat yourself up because you think it's helping you motivate to get you better because you're going to almost punish yourself for mm. not playing the way you want to, it's you're not doing yourself any good. It's not, it's not, it's a false motivation. So you can give yourself a break. Say you're a human being, you did your best. You're still practicing every day. You're working hard at it. And you, maybe you sucked that night. Maybe you did, but it's not going to motiv motivate me any less the next day to practice and get better. So mm. why, might as well talk to yourself in a friendly way than rather than beat yourself up. And I, I felt bad for Brecker and Sanborn was the same way, or he's still mm. alive. So, Sam Moore in the same way. If, if if he's listening, Dave, give yourself a break, bro. <laughs> you're great. You're great. You're David Sanborn, for God's sakes. <laughs> Shout out to David Sanborn if he's listening. Yeah. He's a have you talked to him yet on your Not show? Not yet. No, Not he's yet. A, a big, big fan of the podcast, though. Is he? No, yeah. I, no. Oh. We don't we <laughs> don't, don't know. at this point we don't know. At this point we don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, technically, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's kind of reclusive. So, but if you can get him, he's probably he'd probably be very interesting to talk to. Oh. Uh, I, I I like him. I like him. We have, we've, oh, yeah. we've had a couple of, we did a duet together on, on my album for one song. And besides that, just many festivals where we play together and I, and we'd see each other and it was just super cool. That's awesome. Ryan, if you don't mind, I want to, I want to yeah, ask, uh, I'm going to ask you something here. Uh, Kenny, uh, you talk about all these people you played with and, and the, the list is unbelievable, unbelievable, right? It's incredible. It's insane. And, I, you know, I don't, I have no idea what that feels like, but it must be amazing. But I, I was always wondering, do you have a dream collaboration that you never either got to do or like, you know, for circumstances or you want to do, or maybe it already happened. Did you have one that you did and you're like, that's it. That was like my ultimate dream collaboration. It could be, I guess, recording or gig or, you know, whatever. Oh man. Um, I mean, look for, for a guy that grew up, you know, the first record that I really loved was the Grover Washington Jr. record called Inner City Blues. Mm. That was my first record that I really went, wait, saxophones sound like that? I never knew that. Okay, now I now I really want to play this correctly. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, he was my, my super idol for many, many years. And to then, after I had already had a bunch of success, was able to sit in with him when he played a gig in Chicago at a club called the Park West, I don't know if it's still there anymore. And for him, for me to play that famous song, Mr. Magic with Grover going back and forth, him on tenor, me on soprano back and forth soloing was, I think that's, I don't think I can beat that, you know, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never did play a, a, um, 
a, a duet with Miles. I was I was on the same set, same nights and everything, the same the same show. But no, I think that thing with Grover was kind. Of, I don't think that can be beaten. That's awesome. Yeah, that's pretty that's darn pretty good. Great. I mean, I was just going. I remember that night too. I remember coming back to the hotel. I can picture the hotel room and that. This was in the eighties, so this was thirty years ago, and I just remember thinking. How did I get this in my life? I was just, you know, not that long ago, I was in high school listening to this guy. And tonight he's he's treating me as an equal. Mm. And I'm playing with him and I'm feeling like I'm holding my own against my complete idol. And it's like, okay, wow, I've I, I've really, you know, I, 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 I kind of patted myself on the back. You know, it's like you're working hard at it and the hard work's paying off. So keep going. Keep doing it. How about you? Who 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 would be your dream collaborators at this point? Would it be Bre would it be Brecker? Oh man, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, this last weekend I got to play with uh, the Elvin Jones uh, uh, Lighthouse tribute band, which is basically like the live of the one of my favorite records called Live at the Lighthouse. Elvin Jones. I got to play with the Gene Perla, who was on the record, and Adam Nussbaum, who's in Elvin's chair, and we got to play some gigs in New York, and that was like a dream come true for me. Um, so that was pretty, pretty epic, but I guess dead or alive. I mean, I would, I would absolutely love to have sat in with the Coltrane classic quartet with oh, McCoy wow. and Jimmy Garrison and, and Elvin. I think that would be, you know, yeah. probably my top, top, but also Michael Breck, you know, Michael Brecker is like the reason why I play tenor saxophone. So yeah. that would also be a big, and also you, oh my gosh, that would be crazy too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's an easy one to get right there. That's too easy. Oh, Hey man. Well, <laughs> I'm all I'm I'm down. <laughs> down. Oh, well, we like easy. I have to figure out the right kind of tune because you know you want to come in and you know we could. We could figure something out. Yeah, Ryan, I don't think it's going to work for you. I think I might have to sit in on that. <laughs> yeah, Dave, you know, <laughs> I, I might need some right and some right notes. Not some wrong. Oh, I got you. Oh, I got you. Man, I don't know. I I can turn it on and off. I can turn it on. I know. You know what? I've I've heard you turn it on and off. When you I heard you like do some like legit bebop, uh, kind of bluesy kind of things that. They're, you're right in the key, and it's right in the you know you're playing the the changes, right? You mm -hmm. sound fantastic, bro. On oh, that too, thanks, man. you know thanks. you can do that. You know you got that down. <laughs> Try my you best. Both do. You, know? you both have that stuff down, which is great. I, that's something that I you know I didn't spend too much time practicing, so I don't I don't have it down as much. So I'm I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> oh man, well the collab, man, that collab would be insane. Oh my god, that'd be, that'd be amazing. <laughs> well, maybe, wow, maybe it's maybe it's Mr. Magic. Because then you know it's just in the key of C, so you could yeah, just that's true. tenor, tenor, alto, soprano, tenor, alto, soprano, and you guys can you know you can go off key on the on C as long as you get back there at some point. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'll bring a GPS Man. for Ryan. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. A GPS, right? Just make your way back at some point. Yeah, right? just gonna make a couple left turns. Yeah, it's all wow. good. Well, hey, man. Well, I, I'll fly out to L.A. <laughs> Listen, that's on record now. You said that on record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you should be striving for that. That's that's you're setting your bar too low. Oh, my. Oh, OK. Man. Well, see, now, wait a minute. Now you you're be, doing you the thing be where you beat humble. yourself up. Yeah. 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 You're doing that thing you said not to do. And I love when you guys <laughs> came to my gig, though. That was really cool to have you. there. Oh, man. Yeah. And I hope I, I mean, I'm excited about the thing in May in Orlando. So let me know, man. Let me know. I yeah. yeah, I think both of us are going to be there. Yeah, Dave's going to be in Florida, too. I'm going to yeah. be down there, yep. We're having a Just let me know how many tickets you need. I'll set, I'll set aside, no problem. Uh, you oh, know, man. Best seats that I can that I have access to, which are not oh. necessarily the best seats. <laughs> you know, you know how yeah, you know. You, the, the artist will get a certain set of seats for their, for their guests, but the promoter usually wants to keep the good ones to sell at higher prices. So I do the best I can. Oh, oh man. Listen. We'll we'll take anything. That, that's, that's awesome. Incredible. We just want to see you, yeah. Absolutely. We're being really positive. We're being way too positive, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Part Kenny, of this podcast worst... has to be, yeah. yeah. A we we little have negative. with this one negative thing. What's your worst gig you've ever played? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give a, give a negative or a, a, a hilarious gig story, yeah. whatever, you know. Well, I mean, horrible... that guy, there's, I have so many, like, so many little moments that were just crazy. Um, sure. You know, uh, let's see, what gig did I play? Well, okay, so. I was already uh, my song Songbird was was going crazy here in the states and the records were selling in millions at that point and this is like in the eighty seven or eighty eight time period or whatever and I uh, I get a call hey oh, the there's a morning show in Germany uh, that wants you on there and uh, 
this would be a great way to kind of open you up to an international, you know, because I was doing well in the States and then Asia is starting to open up. And so, sure, sure, sure. So we fly all the way to, to um, Frankfurt, I think is where it was. And we go to the show and I'm getting ready to play my song and I come out and the audience starts chanting a thing that's called Totenhosen. Totenhosen, 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 which was the name of the band that this heavy metal band that was also on the show. Oh. Totenhosen means dead pants in German. That's what it means. <laughs> okay. Dead pants. I'm pretty sure. If there's people that speak German, let me know if that's true, but I'm pretty sure. So anyway, as I'm playing my little sweet little da 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 da, da they're chanting Totenhosen, Totenhosen. Like, get out. Oh no. But so we can hear the Totenhosen band. <laughs> Jeez. And I felt I was so shitty. It was so mean. Wow. Like, come on, man. Wow. I mean, yeah. just I know you want them, but like I'm playing as it's going out on television Ooh. in there. Like, so Songbird, let's say the 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 TV arrangement's like three and a half, four minutes. Well, after like 80 seconds, I look at my keyboard player who's been my who's my high school friend. We've been playing together forever. So if I just like move an eyebrow, he knows what that means. So I <laughs> did something with my face, which meant we're going to the we're going to the, the the final verse and we're out, and so I just played ba 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 the, the shortest song I've ever played, packed <laughs> up my sax and we went right back to the airport and flew back to L A. Wow, man, that's man. crazy, that's rough. That was that's rough. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty rough because because you know it's like you guys you're you're kind of thinking okay you're gonna break open a new market there. Germany's never heard songs like this before. This is new music for them, whatever. And it's like, no, not not today, bro. Not today. You're going home. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> yeah, crazy. That. I gotta look up that band now. I gotta check them yeah, out. Yeah, I know, right? See why yeah. So good. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It must have been really good, but so but that, if I think about like a moment that was like kind of kind of left me feeling crappy, um, you know, there's lots of things that have happened. Like I remember being at the Grammys and I think I think I played that year it was I was feeling kind of frisky. I played, I won a Grammy that year, which was 93. And um, and I was sitting there and there's Sting and there's Herbie and uh, who else? And they were talking and they're going, uh, hey man, you know, you let's all get together and jam later and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just kind of, I'm standing with them and then they're talking and I go, cool, that sounds great. And they look at me and go, yeah, Kenny, but we'll see you later. Oh. I, I don't get to go with them. And it was like, wow, that was so mean. On the day that you won a Grammy and you were playing there. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm sure the jazz police, as I say that, will, 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 will probably be saying, see, I told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, you know, you don't belong with them. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know what, guys? Okay, F you. I thought to myself, you know, you know, you don't want me. Cool. I'm just going to keep doing what I do and I'll see you guys around. And, you know, and it's funny, not, not, that, uh, not that they were mean about it, but it's funny, like at one uh, recent pre Grammy party. I'm sitting right next. I'm sitting next to Herbie Hancock, and we're just chit chatting, and it's like we're like the best of friends. And I'm thinking, you know, you don't remember any of those. The lab, you don't remember that moment, and I don't hold it. You know, you were just right. whatever doing, what doing, but you know. Wow, it's it's cool though. I'm here now, bro. I'm here. I'm still. Yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. Right. You're out still here. Still here doing my thing. That's crazy. We yeah. we asked that we've asked a couple of other guests about you know things and 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 Dave and mine are all uh, were about wedding gigs and I'm super curious. Did you ever in your younger career ever play a wedding gig, or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I played played a few. Yeah, yeah. Do you have Absolutely. any weird stories about funny weddings or anything like that? Uh, no, no, not really. No, no. Just, Man, I've done them and mm -hmm. and I'm I'm cool with it. You know, I, I yeah. don't mind. I, I again it's like every gig to me every gig every single gig is as if i'm at carnegie hall and my career depends on how i play that night if i'm playing a wedding it's the same exact feeling if i'm playing in a in a hotel room with four people it's the same feeling so when wow. i'm doing a gig for a wedding it was like i would just wanted to do my my best i played for or one of the you know kevin na the professional golfer oh yeah he was a friend of mine and he asked me to play for his wedding Whoa. <laughs> uh, and I said, wow. sure, I'll do it. He goes, but I, but I want to pay you. I said, Kevin, we're friends. You don't have to pay him. He goes, no, man, I'm paying you. <laughs> wow. I said, okay. I said, okay, well, just bring me some cash and whatever you want to give me in cash. <laughs> nice. We brought, brought some cash in a paper bag. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gangster. 
That's it's crazy. Cool. It was wow. And, and I, by the way, I had a great time doing it because it was heartfelt, you know, for him because yeah. he's a friend. But um, you know, now I would I play weddings now. Wow. You just gotta you just gotta pay the price. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, that's Man. cheaper than you. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't mind. So wow. what, now you guys had wedding gigs where you just hated them or. It just like my my short story of the, my horrible gig story was I got asked to play flute and uh, oh. I, I I play I kind of play flute and yeah. and basically I was the cue to have the bride walk down the aisle when I start playing with with this you know band. What, what were you going to play on flute? Anything? Specific it was like or? a it was like a Taylor Swift song. I don't remember which one oh, it was. Wow. Yeah, okay. and I was like reading a sheet music because I wanted to make sure I was like everything was cool. And I, right. I go to go play the flute and I've been practicing it and the band is in the wrong key. And <gasps> I'm trying to like find where I'm going oh, and I no. can't I can't find it. And everybody looks really confused because they're like waiting to hear this well-known Taylor Swift song and they're not hearing it. So I f somehow figure out like five notes or whatever and I start playing it over and over and over again. She walks down the aisle, whatever. We had to, wa we had to play another one as she walks up. So I'm like scrambling to tell the band like, hey guys, like we need to make sure that we're in the right key. Da, 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 da. And luckily before that, I had my soprano with me because we were playing uh, like cocktail hour tunes or whatever. So my soprano was yeah. like next to me. So they we go, uh, they're, they're about to walk up the aisle after they've just been announced that the husband and wife and I go to play the next popular Taylor Swift song, or whatever. And I'm in the wrong key again, of All course. Right. And so I threw my flute onto the grass. It was outside. And I picked up my soprano and I played it, you know? <laughs> but I was so embarrassed. And, and a lot of people in the crowd were like, really, like, what's going on? But luckily I got away with it and everything was okay. But that was my horrible gig story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. man. That's a real yeah. David, do you have one too? Yeah. Mine also involved a, a corporate thing. And I'm doing Careless Whisper on tenor. And it was this big thing where they had the smoke machine, you know, the lights, the whole thing. Now we're gonna feature the saxophone player Dave, and I was gonna come through the smoke. I got my leather jacket on, you know, and, and I was gonna alto and, too. It's alto, it's perfect. I well, I yeah, but I <laughs> that's what I told them. But I I played all the other stuff on tenor. They're like, no, 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 we keep it on the same thing because it's like a quick turnaround from the last. I was like, whatever, you know, it's fine. I could do it. It's a high starts on the high F sharp. It's cool, right? So yeah, I guess, right. just got done playing some other thing, like literally right before it went off, came back on. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, the high F, the side high F key, the first key, the soldering broke, so it was hung wide open. Oh, so not no. as so it was like <laughs> Oh no. I, the guitar, everybody's staring at me like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm not doing this on purpose. I, I <laughs> not a single note played. I turn around, everybody's staring at me like and I tell the guitar player, I'm like, take it. And I walk off the stage. <laughs> Brutal. People are so like, oh. of course, it can't be on like, you know, a random Coltrane tune. It has to be on a tune like, like <laughs> yours, Ryan. Like everybody's like waiting. It was like, like blank they, space. We even told like them that. what we were doing too. It, it wouldn't even be as bad if they just played a thing. And I was like, honk. They'd be like, oh, this is kind of weird. But it was like, you're going to hear this song featured okay. the saxophone player. Yeah. That, and, that, and that sax solo is so famous. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. da, 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 da. I play that so many times. Well, I get asked to do that on cameos. They ask me to play. Oh, yeah. oh really? Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a I have a um a track for it. And oh, it yeah. sounds make it sound really good here too. So oh, I bet. Yeah. that's killing. But, you know, that's that's a shame when when the when the mechanics of the horn and and by the way, if you know, if you're not a sax player, you're thinking like well, how can you not know your sax is broken? You know, there's like a hundred thousand little things on that horn. You don't, you're not looking at it when you're playing. You can't say, oh, I can tell that this is about to, that, that thing's about exactly. to break. You don't know yeah. that. It just happens. <laughs> yeah, it's not like a key, key fell off a piano or something. Like, right. you can see that. See that, yeah. Oh. Oh. And then, and, and Ryan, for you, the probably because flute's in the key of C, it's like transposing it. Your ear is not going to hear the, your, like yeah. if I was playing flute, I wouldn't be able to hear the notes as well. I on the yeah. soprano, I can't. I'm used to hearing it in B flat. Right. Even when I play it, though, it's tricky for me because I don't, yeah. I don't think in E flat. You know. Same here, and that was that was 100 the issue. Is I was hearing also a half a whole step away because of the C and B flat thing, exactly. and then yeah, so it was a no, it was a disaster. But you were playing the right notes. They were that's the and that's here's another thing. So that I think that that we sax players can can support each other. Like we're out there. So, and I tell this to my keyboard player, 
who I love dearly. I said, bro, if you play a wrong chord and I play the right note, I sound like I'm making a mistake mm. every time. So please, you can't, don't make me, I mean, if, if, if I, I, and when, when that happens, all I want to do is take my sax out and tell the audience, he did it, not me. <laughs> I'm not going to hit, usually not going to hit any wrong notes. You know, when I'm playing my stuff, I don't yeah. usually because they're my songs. So I should know how to play them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. But when he, if he hits the wrong course, like, ah, oh, bro, come on, man. I just, I'm standing out there looking stupid. And anyway, <laughs> I, I don't like that, but we, that's the, that's the, the brunt that we have to take because we're the lead instrument out there in the front. And if the chord doesn't match, we sound like we're off, even yeah. if the chord's off. Right. Yeah. yeah. I should have, I should have, uh, uh, had more confidence to get more upset with the uh, g guitar player and the keyboard player that were playing with me. But it was also the other thing that I didn't mention. It was like, it was the first gig I had played with this wedding company. Oh. So like, I didn't know anybody. So it oh. was like, and uh, and the other thing is like, they didn't know that I played saxophone really at all. They heard me play a little bit of soprano for like a tune. So they probably thought I was like a woodwind doubler or something like that. Oh. And they hear me like completely screw up on flute. It was... But yeah, anyway, it was, yeah. I, I haven't played my flute in a long time. I used to play it all the time. Um, really? When I, well, for those kids with like with uh, with Liberace and Sammy Davis Jr. And I played the Ringling Brothers Circus gig, you know, the Whoa, backup wow. band for that. You know, you have to double all, you know, yeah. I play my clarinet, my flute, my, uh, was I playing tenor? I'm most, playing mostly tenor then, tenor, clarinet and flute. And then one gig, um, they they said, hey, you can, you can be in Liberace's, uh, orchestra, but you, you you need to play oboe. You play oboe, don't you? I said, absolutely, I play oboe. Which I'd never, I'd never <laughs> yeah. touched no in my life. Wow. I said, when's the gig? The gig's next Monday. I said, yeah, okay, cool. And so then I went and uh, I found the the guy that played in the Seattle Symphony Orchestra that played oboe. I found him. I said, bro, you're teaching me to play oboe in one, we got one week. One week, <laughs> I'm playing Liberace's band. I need to play oboe. He goes, well, first we have to learn to teach you how to make reads. I said, I said, bro, I said, F that. You make, you, make, you make my reads. You make the reads. I pay you for the reads. Make me some great reads. I, yeah, yeah. Show me how to play it. And, and it took a week. And then I had a big solo with Liberace. And the other Is there oboe. a recording of this? There's got to be a recording, I right? Hope I hope not. Oh, <laughs> man. We need man, this. We got to find this. has that. to surface. That's but I played, but I played okay. It was, a, it was a song called You Don't Send Me Flowers. Okay. It's a very famous song back in the day. And it had this big oboe solo. And I played the oboe solo and it's like, it was pretty good. I got to say, it was pretty good. And that's all I really needed to do on the oboe, put it down. And then I did my thing that I could do well, but doubling, man, doubling is, is not, I don't care about doubling anymore. I'm not, I'm right. done with that. Yeah. I just, you know, I practice my soprano. I played, as you saw in my concert, I also play my tenor, but yeah. I practice mostly soprano and practice the tenor as much as I, I could, but you know, there's just so much, you only have so much time. Only have so this much time. You can only do so much. Yeah, and that that's yeah. a great transition, uh, Kenny, into in an, another section that we like to talk about is is hobbies and things outside of saxophone and, and music. And right. uh, you know, I I know from from uh, seeing you on TV and and all that stuff that you're a great golfer uh, and uh, practice that outside. But speaking of you know having time, not not so much time in the day. What are some areas that you go into when you're not practicing and not performing and touring and such good question well i know you like golf ryan because i've seen some of your uh some of your posts and you know i dabble oh thanks. i bet you kill it you you hit the ball so far i bet it's really far uh but, uh, well i'm I, i'm what's, gonna what's i'm your, gonna yeah huh what's your handicap now when i was living in florida i was around a scratch right around Ooh. a scratch but I, uh, ever, you know, I, I don't, I only get to golf maybe like four and a half months, five months out of the year here, you know, and it's not super yeah. consistent, but you know, I mean, if, if I'm having a good round, I'll shoot around 75, 77, you know, right around there. But when I was living in Florida, I was golfing all the time, man, you know, like doing that. And, and that was more like, I, I would shoot right around par, but nowadays it's a little bit worse, but yeah. Yeah, I don't play as much as I used to either. I'm I'm just traveling too much. So, mm -hmm. but I love golf. I I mean, I used to love golf. I don't know if I love it as much anymore. I I I used to, but now that I'm not playing as good, I don't know if I love it as much. You know, <laughs> yeah. which I got to learn how to do. I'm I'm my brain is geared to liking things that I'm good at mm -hmm. and getting good at the things I like. Mm -hmm. So, 
Okay, so I got I, I got down to a scratch, uh, actually a plus one handicap I got down to at one Woo! point. Uh, nice. But now I'm, you know, if I, if I broke 80, I'd be ecstatic. Okay, gotcha. If I did now. And so now it's from when, as I play golf now, it's like, I don't know, is, it, is, is am I having that much fun doing it? You know, I played golf with Jack Nicholas a few times. And when and we're when we're chit chatting on the, the fairway, I said to Jack, I said, I know that you don't play golf very much anymore. I bet it's because you don't feel good not being able to play like you used to. He goes, It's exactly what it is. Wow. You know, it's not that much fun to me. So I'll do it. Like I'm playing today with you know, part of this pro am thing. But I, I'd prefer to play tennis, he says. Oh. Because I have there's no there's no expectation to play great. Sure. You know? Sure. Mm. Have you ever um, played Augusta? Did you ever get a chance to play Augusta? I played that. I played a few times. Yeah. Wow. That's like that's my dream course. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Of all time. Yeah. It's um. What's that like? It's, it's much much more of a hilly course than you see on TV. Mm. You'd be shocked at when you play number nine, how downhill you walk off the fair off the tee, and then how much uphill that that green is. So it's really tricky. Wow. Uh, it, it was a great experience. I got to stay in one of the cabins. And, uh, yeah. you know, I had the whole experience. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, wow. Do you remember what you shot? Well, we were playing from the members' tees. And by the way, Ryan, from the members' tees, it's so short. Oh, really? So short. Mm. Uh, it's not hard. I think I shot 74. Wow, man. Gotta those keep greens, the though. Happy. That's, Gotta keep that's, them happy. That's still but, a great you know, score. But yeah. it was, it's, it's like, you know. You got a putt. You still got a putt, yeah. But the green, look, at the greens, they, the, when we played it, they're not lightning fast. Oh, I see. It's, it wasn't set up to be very difficult when we went. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went along with a, a group that decided they w would invite me. Uh, wow. You know, sending like a private plane to L.A. to take a few L.A. people, fly to uh, Augusta, private, you know, chauffeur to the course, stay in the, in the in the cabins. Wow. And then play the course and then fly privately home. Okay, come on. Who's going to say no to that? <laughs> yeah. Jeez. That that's crazy cool. wow but yeah that was well, that was cool um so yeah so i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out how i want to think about golf I'm, or, or can i enjoy something that i'm not really that great at anymore mm. that, that's kind of a hard thing and, and i want i want it to be the latter i don't want to give up golf because i'm not good at it i mm -hmm. want to be able to enjoy being pretty good i'm not going to be i'm not going to be awful because i know how to hit the golf ball and i know how to score enough not going to be awful. I'm not going to shoot 95, but you know, so I'm working on that. I'm working on that part. And, um, I'm determined, I'm determined to figure out how to enjoy myself without being great at it. Uh, flying on the other hand, you better be good at flying. <laughs> yeah. You can't just be, yeah, I'm not that good at flying anymore, but I think I'll still do it. <laughs> how often do you do that? Cause I know you, you're a pilot. How often do you get up? And, well, uh... I would like to get up like once a week uh, when wow. I'm home here because you got to keep your training going. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're an bar pilot, if you're meaning that you're flying in the clouds and you're relying on your instruments, you got to, that's a skill you got to keep training. It's like back to six sacks, you know, you know, yeah, yeah. you might think you got your licks down, but if you didn't touch your sacks for six months, can you pick it up and play those things perfectly? Probably not. Probably not perfectly, but you'd mm -hmm. be still pretty, probably pretty great. But Flying, you know, it's a skill you want to keep going. So about once a week, but, you know, um, I haven't been flying that much lately either. So when that happens, what I do is I go to the airport and I call one of my friends who's an instructor. I said, and his name's Curtis. Said, Curtis, come on, let's go. I want you for, you know, so we fly for like six hours. Wow. And, and he shows me stuff. And then we do that for a few days. And then I'm back, back to top, top of my game again. Nice. Wow. You never want to have an ego when it comes to flying and think that you got it. You gotta, you want to know that you're, you know, I'm rusty. So let's let me take up a, a pro with me and and we'll get the rust off together. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. That's kind of that's kind of. I love I love watching movies. I don't know if you guys are movie buffs, but I I love watching movies. So, uh, and one of the things I've always wanted to do would be a film score, and it's just one of those things that's eluded my my um, my radar for some reason and. I just, I, you know, I can't, I can't get arrested. You know I mean? It's like, I could break somebody's window and they won't arrest me because I, it's just one of those gigs where the director has to like want you to be the, the film guy. And if you don't have that relationship, they're not going to, they're not going to really mm -hmm. like pay much attention to you. So at this mm -hmm. point, I haven't had much su success in that department. 
Mm. Does that interest you guys? Film music? Oh yeah, I didn't know. I actually didn't know that you that you were a pilot. Oh no, yeah, yeah, I've been That's flying awesome. since. I got my pilot's license in 1989, so you know, 30 wow. 30 years. Yeah. I've got almost 5,000 hours of flying. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. So you know, it's not like anything else, like sax playing. You know, I probably have 50,000 hours of sax playing, or 45. Sure. I, I try to calculate it, but somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna be, you got to be pretty good. You know, you can't be. You can't be crack, crappy if you've done something for 50,000 hours. Right. 5,000 hours of flying, you're going to be pretty good, you know? Wow, yeah. But, but there's guys that have 25, 30, 40, 30,000 hours of flying, and these guys are so pro, you know? So wow. I go flying with those guys. Okay, okay teach me. What are your, give, give me the tricks of this. And they mm. they, they lay their, 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 these gems on you, you know? It's like, thank you. That's One so of the cool. gems, which is great, that one pilot told me, uh, his name is Jeff. Uh, he used to be a pilot for Delta, 40 years with Delta captain. And now he just flies his private plane and he, he we go up. So he's one of the gems. He goes, okay, here's what you do. No, don't move fast in the cockpit. Everything's slow, except for, for your eyes. Your eyes are fast. Your eyes are looking at everything and your, your, your input's fast, but your hands are slow. You're not moving around fast, very slow, but the eyes are going. And I like that. I like that whole idea of just like my eyes darting around at checking things out and, and getting all the input, but I'm just going to kick it. I'm going to kick it nice and slow and make sure everything's perfect. You know, are wow. these a prop planes or, or jets or what are you flying? It's prop plane. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. My dad actually, uh, Ryan, I don't even know if you know this. My dad used to once again, probably back in the eighties was uh he flew Cessnas, you know, yeah. just, just around nothing like big, but you know, the little flew around the local airport and stuff. So I, I, he took me up, I think when I was little a few times, but so I know wow. like this much, not much. I, I've already exhausted all my plane knowledge with you. I've already, <laughs> I can't impress you anymore with my plane yeah. knowledge. You know, <laughs> it's, that's cool though. It, it's a cool, it's a cool yeah. skill. Cause there's, you know, it's, it's another thing you can't, you can't like, like being a great, a great sax player. You can't buy that. You have to earn it by, by, by devoting some time and attention to it. Like a pilot, pilot's license. You can be the richest guy in the world, but you can't buy a pilot's license. You actually have to train. Right. And you need to get good. And, and, Unfortunately, some of the guys that have all that money and the ego, they're not, they don't set it up to where people can tell them what they need to work on. And mm. then they become pilots that think that they're better than they are. And then they end up, you know, crashing, which we don't, which, you know, we yeah. know famous crashes. That's probably because they were never told enough times, Hey, Hey, you need to work on that skill. You're, you know, don't do right. this. Don't do that. I'm always about like any, anybody, uh, or, or I mean, anything that I do that I care about, I want honest feedback about, mm -hmm. you know, I definitely want it. I don't, I don't want anyone telling me I'm great at, at something. If I'm not, then how am I going to get better? I'm, if I already think I'm great, I'm not going to practice. Yeah. But, you know, so like, bro, so when you guys do, Ryan, I know you teach, do you teach Dave as well? Yeah, I do. So yeah. When you teach your student, what do you, well, how do you guys go about teaching and how do you do like, what do you tell, what do you tell them to work on? I'm, I'm curious about that. Dave, you can go first. <laughs> oh, well, uh, well, it depends. <laughs> That's a bad answer. I know, but, um, it really, good yeah, well, it, de I think it depends on the goal because I I've taught so many different, I'm a public school teacher, by the way. Um, as well as, you know, I do things online and, and all these other things, but I, I think it's always about the goal and, and kind of their own path. I always say every, every I say kid, but every person is on their own path at different points. Not everybody's path is become a professional musician. Some of their path is, and, and it's not to say that you shouldn't care about it if it's just a hobby, but you know, there, there are different paths. And the cool thing is if schools set it up right, you can, you know, have different levels where you have the, 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 the higher achievers and they're going to be working on things like I'll, you know, I'll, I'll work with a kid and we're working on playing changes and really working on different elements of like actually playing. And then other kids, it's like, Hey, let's just today, let's just work on like playing in tune a little bit and just like, I'm going to play a, like a couple notes, see if you can try to play them back, like ear training stuff, you know, always technique stuff, sight reading, stuff like that. Um, but I think, yeah, it's always about the path and always about the goal. Like if the kid is in a band where they only play a couple concerts a year, you know, we can take time and work on things. If we know they're playing a lot of rep and they're playing tons of tunes, we work so much on like reading and time and like just like fundamental stuff to get them and then playing as an ensemble playing as a big band most of the time you know um all that stuff but i i really like vary differentiate the teaching depending on on the kid or 
their mentality or really it's it's where they're at and where the next steps are. I'm always about just little steps. Like, yeah, that's great that you want to play giant steps in 12 keys, but you can't play a G major scale. Let's take a step back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and just teach them where they're at. And um, just, I, I'm always like, I always like to push them to the next thing. Always try to say like, okay, let's, let's raise the bar, but also say like, Hey, look how far you've come too. It's the gap in the gain. The gap yeah. is what you're looking ahead towards. The gain is behind you. So what, what you've done. So it's always, Hey, look at the gain. Look how far you've come. But now we're going to shoot for this hit there. Now look at the gap. Wow. That's great. Okay. But now we're, so it's always, they're always chasing that, that, you know, carrot out front. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I teach everything, uh, tone, technique, sight reading, improvisation, playing together all, you know, it's like, but it depends on the kid, depends on the ensemble, the age, the, and then adults, you know, depends on their goals. Like, Hey, I just want to play at church on Sunday. Right. That's going to be different than a kid who's like, I want to major in music for mm. jazz performance. Right, right, right. You know, sure. so, so yeah, so it's, you know, but it's fun because you get to see something click with them, whether it's for whether, and what I've noticed is whether people practice for fun or because they're, they're, they have an audition or something, when it clicks, they all act the same. Everybody's like, they get that aha moment, no yeah. matter what you're practicing for a gig or you're practicing for a birthday party or, you know, everybody has that, that they all react the same way, which I think is pretty cool. That's so. great. Yeah. So that's, I don't know. That's how I teach. <laughs> it seems like you got a passion for it. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad I made the cameo for you. You sound like a good teacher. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> what about yeah. you, Ryan? You got guys coming in there to learn all those wrong notes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I teach uh, a little bit now uh, in public schools, um, uh, part-time at this high school in, in Massachusetts. And I actually just sub for Jerry Braganzi at NEC, uh, last week too. So I'm starting to get more into the classroom and stuff. But one, one thing that I've kind of more on the detail side of what Dave's talking about is like finding how every student kind of associates certain things, right? You know, like I'm always trying to find uh, different ways to explain the same thing to see what connects with somebody, you know, because for me, uh, I was lucky enough to have a lot of great teachers throughout my life, you know, and they all would explain things in a little bit of different way. And then once I got one of them that was like, okay, I understand this, I would like kind of go down a further path with them as a teacher and whatnot. So I really like, in you know, finding out how certain students can relate things they already know well to new concepts. And how can we make a practice routine that is easier to learn new things based on things that we're already really good at. Um, whether that's a high schooler or, or a 65 year old, you know, I mean, like, I think that's, you know, a, a good way to, to kind of approach it. And, you know, my dad's a, a, a saxophone teacher and I've, I've watched him teach, you know, my entire life. And so, you know, seeing him give lessons to every kind of, you know, person and player was a really great, you know, first step in how to kind of make my own lessons and whatnot. And, but yeah, that's kind of what I've been focusing on recently is how, how can I get this person to understand this concept based on things that they're already good at, you know, and kind of moving yeah, yeah. on from there. So that's cool. That's really yeah. cool. Wow. Yeah, that yeah. it sounds really cool. I've, I've never had a chance to, to do any of that. So uh, I wouldn't even know where to start. Man, that's that. So you're 100% self-taught all the way through? Yeah. Wow. I mean, in high school, there was a there was a guy named Johnny Jessen that I took lessons from, but I think Mostly I learned from him was, was how to play flute better. Um, but as far as the, the sax, not really. Uh, no, there was never a, a teacher that went through anything with me. I just, I just you know, went home and put the records on that I liked and wrote down the licks. I mean, I still have like big volumes of notes that I wrote down on solos that I thought were cool and just practiced those things and Man. figured out how, how I wanted to play them and what sounded good and then... Little by little, you know, things started to just kind of move. I don't, I don't even know how it happened. You know, it's like yeah. practicing. Then I played the gig with Barry White, and then because of that, I got some more gigs. And I played more gigs, and then Jeff Lorber called. I went on the road with him for five years, playing his music, and then Clive Davis asked me if I wanted to make my own record, and then I made that record, and then now I'm here 20, 20 plus records later. It's like wow. Well, four, that was 40, 40 years ago that was my first record my first album 40 wow. years can't, even, can't even, it's been that long wow crazy that's, that's incredible yeah it's really it's 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 incredible and i think uh from from a uh a younger view of that like not a lot of teachers nowadays maybe and dave can speak on this too uh 
teach that way of like go home and listen to the record and transcribe like a lot of it is is not to because I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying it's great with all the technology that, that we have and all of the pdf books that are there and everything is fantastic and i studied with uh chad leftwitz brown who i now work for that has this yeah. mega you know jazz lesson video thing and i learned via pdfs and i took zoom lessons with him and that's fantastic but i also because he told me would transcribe and do the things that you're talking about. And I think some students, and maybe you can speak on this so that they can hear it from a legend like you, uh, like it's it's important to do what you're talking about, like transcribing, doing the records alongside using all the technology that we have now and all the resources that we have now. But it's a two-part thing. You can't just do one, like you can't just do the PDF thing or just read a book and this stuff's going to come out. Like, you know, there's there's all these things in the recordings and like the influ uh, the the inflections, the nuance, the articulation, all that stuff. Like you learn that directly from the source, you know? So maybe you can speak on that for a second. You mean like, because I was listening to the records and doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's well, how you learned. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, it's funny too, because now, like I said, um, you know, you can get the giant step solo. I just use that as an example. Cause that, that seems to be like the standard of playing giant steps. People want to play it in every key. It's like, okay, I understand that that would be a great exercise for your fingers and a great exercise to for your mind. I don't know how useful it would actually be. Be mm -hmm. honest with you, it's a lot. I'm sure it would take a, years to do that. I'm not sure how useful that will be. It's like you know, if you're if you're on the if you're at the driving range and you're determined to to play a a low a low fade, but the whole course never never uh, you never hit it outside on the golf course. Like why would you work on that for so long if you're never going to really use it? Right. I always thought that about some of the things about some solos like that i thought you know i could get this i'm never going to really use it let me let me work on things that i'm going to use um yeah so that's great. as far as the transcribing is concerned i it's uh so i use giant steps as an example so you know you can go online and it's written all written out every note but and i've read and i've i've gone through it and i've read it and it's like wow i have no connection to that but when i write it myself and i write it down myself now, it's not going to look beautiful like it is on on the transcriptions. It'll be, but I'll write it in enough so I can see what I'm doing. I, I it sticks more. It sticks more. It's like, it's almost like you know, if somebody hands you a piece of paper with a story, and you read it, but if you wrote that story yourself, that story would be, I'd be in there, even though it's yeah. the same words. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a missing piece there, and I I I think that there's a lot of value to an ear training too to like. Like, I can't tell you how many times I would say, what key is this thing in that he's playing? Is he playing, is he playing D, E, F sharp, G, or is it, is it half step down from that? Or is it half step up? I can't tell. And I listen over and over and it's like, I'm it's somewhere in between. What should, should I push my mouthpiece in and, and bring my tone up or should I pull out? I don't know. And I, and then now I would look at, oh, well, somebody wrote it and there, those are the right notes. But I worked on it and then finally, like there would be one note that I know is the right note. Okay, that note tells me the whole thing is in this key and I've been, I've been, I'm a half step off the whole thing. So I start over again, write it all down again. And there, I think there's a lot of value there. So that, totally. that's what I think. Um, I never, I don't like it. I don't like it all spoon fed. I, and here's, here's another reason why. Um, and this is no, this is no, um, this is no slight to anything or anybody, no slight. Technology is wonderful. I mean, look at look at this right here. Like like, I mean, I I do solos in here that are that I'm not saying they're amazing because of me. I'm saying they're amazing that I can do what I do. Like play twelve solos and put together the solo. Like when I'm if I'm working on a a solo for like when the weekend asked me to do a song a solo on one of his songs. It's like okay, and he says, oh yeah, but what we're 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 gonna film tomorrow. I said, oh, all right. Um, so I'm not going to just come in there and wing it, you know, so I work on it here and I work on it, work on it and play, play. And I put together like a definitive solo that's just effing perfect, <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't be able to do that without this equipment because I do remember making records where we didn't have the editing like we do with Pro Tools and Logic and the things that we use now. I use Pro Tools all the time. So I can, you know, and I remember when the 3348 the digital the digital 48 track tape machines came out, which, you know, the fact that we could, we could like slip a note in was unreal. Like, are you kidding? Wait a minute. I can fix notes. 
So that's great. So now doing all that, there's some amazing stuff. And I use it when I make my records because I believe that when I put out a record, it should be like a work of art. It's not, for me, it's not just, how did I play Tuesday night in the studio? That's not how I make records. Not saying that you shouldn't. I mean, other people make records, great, great. But not that's not me. My thing is, my when my record comes out, it's going to be what I consider the most perfect thing that I can do in this time period of my period. It could be a year time period, whatever it is. And if I don't like a note, I'm fixing that note. And if a note's out of tune, I'm going to make sure it's in tune. And Or if it's out of tune that, and I like it, cool. You know what I'm saying? So that's great. But the bad thing about technology, in my opinion, is that everybody around the world, all the young players coming up today have access to the same stuff. I have access to everything. They have access to Instagram videos of great players like Dave and Ryan, and they can watch every note that they play. I never could say that. I never could, never could, I couldn't dial up a sax player. Mm -hmm. I could barely find a record and play one. And I, and you couldn't re record it. You just could hear it. There was no, I had no tape machine. So there's no way to record it and work on it. You just had to plan, play it over and over on the, on the, on the turntable and try to figure the notes out. Now I'm not saying that's, you know, it's like, hey, I walked to school in the snow 10 miles, you know, you, these kids these days. <laughs> it's not meant to yeah. sound like that. It's meant to be like, that's how I think people develop a personal, unique sound. You're left to, to in your own world and you're not hearing everything. You're not seeing everything. So all the players, there's a lot of great players, but a lot of them sound the same to me. Mm. Great. I mean, unbelievable technique. Great. But, you know, I mean, Brecker... He wasn't he wasn't hearing everybody in the world when he figured out how to play a sax. Sanborn wasn't. He was listening to Hank Crawford because I talked to Sanborn about this. He goes, yeah, man, I was just trying to sound like Hank Crawford and, and it never could sound right to me, he said. I said, yeah, you ended up sounding like David Sanborn. <laughs> he goes, yeah, I know. And I didn't like it at first. Wow. And same with me. I, I wanted to sound like Grover Washington Jr. Never could. I sound like me. And I didn't like it at first. But then after a while, it's like, I guess that's who I sound like is me. So that's one of the downsides. Now, I'm not saying that, that anyone should change anything that they do and study the way you want to study, but th I think there's a little bit of downside to everybody having access to all the same stuff because of how well connected we are. Yeah, yeah. There's I think, concern. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. And I think that a big thing also is like putting in the time, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you say 50,000 hours on the instrument and like, that's time that cannot be made up from a PDF book or even, you know, all these great resources, like I said, that are fantastic. But like you put in those hours to play the saxophone, to make it your sound. Like that's like people want the easiest answer right off the bat always. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And and that's something that is hard to sell to people and, and tell people. It's like, well, it actually you got to put in the hours and do it. You got to pick up your saxophone every day. You got to do this, that and the other thing, you know. And, and my dad always said, like, the hardest part is starting. But once you start, it's like, then you get in a routine of it and you're cool. You know what I mean? And then five years go by and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm playing, playing, playing saxophone for five years. And then, you know, it just keeps rolling on. But that's that's great advice. The process is so important. What do you guys do for practicing? Like, do you practice every day? Do you have a time schedule that you practice? Or do you, is it just where you work it in when you can work it in with your schedules? How do you look at practicing? Dave, you want to go? Well, my... my... Mine's definitely not as regimented as it used to be, time-wise, life-wise. Um, I end up practicing for two reasons. One, just for the fun of it, and two, when I need to, if I'm like, you know, for a, for a recording, for a gig, and I need to, which I actually really like that aspect because it sometimes I, I end up practicing things I definitely would, wouldn't have practiced because, you know, you get in your practice habits and you're like, you, you end up dig, going, that's really hard. I know I need, ah, let me just play this fun thing, you know? So it's like, it's hard to push yourself through it. Like I used to, you know, when I was in college and, you know, it's like this and your whole life, all you have to do is wake up, maybe go to one or two classes and then yeah. practice all day. It's like easy. It's like, you know, so it's, it, for me, it's definitely not regimented. Um, but I'm always big on efficient practicing. I'd rather practice for 10 minutes focused than just like randomly practice for like an hour or two. Now that's playing to me. Like playing is cool. Just playing tunes, playing whatever, but like practicing, unfocused practicing to me can almost do more harm. You know, I'm, I'm big on practice makes permanent. So if you start practicing something, and you're not focused and you do, you know, you could develop bad habits. You can develop, you know, so I'd rather be focused for a shorter amount of time. Um, so if I pick up the horn and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to, 
I, I just, I'm adhering something recently, or like you're talking about transcription. I'm also big on only transcribing like small snippets of solos. Barely sure. ever do I do long, you know? So I'm like, yeah. you know, I, yeah, I heard this line, you know, I'm like, you know, let me check that out. Okay. And I'll just focus on that one thing. Just, I'm not going to go through, I'm going to play every scale I know in 12 keys with a metric. It's like, that's cool. And I've done that in the past, but like for right now, I'm going to focus on this one thing. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how I approach it now at this point in my life. I like yeah. that. I like that idea of trans. It's like when I transcribe stuff now, uh, I still do it the old fashioned way. I just write it down. Yeah. Um, but it's only like if I hear just a little part of a, like it could be an amazing solo, but there's just one little part that I go, OK, there's something special in there. I want to know how did he get the what is the what is that little thing that he does? Like I was just doing this, um, the Stan Getz uh, song called uh, Here's That Rainy Day. Right. Mm hmm. Like, wow, what are those notes? And I go, oh, now I, I can play them. And and so it just made me really happy just to get that little part. Because I can I can get the rest if I want to, but, but I don't need it. But how did he do that? So I, I like that. Yeah. But Ryan, we, how, how about you, man? Yeah, I... Uh... I am a big uh, maintenance practicer. So in, in kind of a way where when I'm feeling like I, I, I would say to start off, I'm not like as consistent as I was maybe a year ago when I was in grad school, because now I'm, I'm working a little bit more and traveling a little bit more. So it's yeah. a little bit like my practice, like, you know, is a little bit less consistent. But I love uh, having time with my saxophone where I'm just working on playing the saxophone like uh, I did a. I was in Indiana for a couple of days uh, doing a master class and and playing on my friend's grad recital, and uh, I had, like the couple of days before then I didn't have time to practice and then I had to fly and all this stuff and I was feeling really crappy and I just I had an hour to myself in this practice room at the university where I just like played scales and like did some maintenance stuff and I remember the rest of that week I had gigs and I felt so much better on the saxophone because I had that time to do my maintenance practice so. I usually, if I know I'm going to have like a string of gigs together, I'll do like a nice maybe day or two, like a couple hours of maintenance stuff, maybe transcribe something a little bit. Uh, but I also have really gotten into since grad school of practicing away from the horn, like just like uh, listening to music and trying to transcribe it without the saxophone and then seeing if I can play it when I get the saxophone in my hands, you know, that kind of right. even learning tunes that way, like just like listening to them a bunch of times in a row and then and then learning them and that has connected my ear a lot more to my horn uh, when I when I start to play and stuff. So I like to keep those two things kind of going. And then when I'm home in Boston, I, I love to have days where I just can practice. It doesn't happen as often anymore, but I, I love it. It's, it's like meditative to me. You know, it's like my yeah. my alone time, you know. I, I, I agree. That's that's why in the morning when I get when I do it, every, everyone in my life knows that basically between you know 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. or 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., that, that I am not to be, I mean, I, actually, I don't even mind when, like, like if my son's home and if I'm practicing, he comes into the room and he chit chats with me for five minutes or so. I yeah. actually really enjoy that. But they know that I'm going to do this every morning. They, everybody knows it. Uh, if I go on vacation, they know. It's like, okay, I'm going to ask the hotel, okay, I'm going to be playing my sax. I need, do you, have a, do you have a room that I can use? If not, I'm going to do it in the room and maybe the neighbors aren't going to like it, but that's the way it goes. And then they usually find me a place and I do that. Um, and it's very much that alone time. Um, and I, you know, for me, it's like, it's like, it's like, I just want, I want to go over the things I know how to play to make sure I'm still sharp on them. So I go over that stuff. Then I hopefully listen to something and come and find a new little thing. And then some, some days I'm very creative and I, like, um, like I was listening to one of one Brecker solo the other day. I don't remember where it was from. And he played some, uh, um, some lick. Um, I don't know. He played some, it sounded like almost, I don't like almost like a diminished kind of a, a pattern. I go, I love that little thing he put in his solo. So I wrote out that and I go, okay, I'm going to make that into an exercise. And then I put it in like four or five different keys. I don't do it in 12 keys because I'm not going to play in all 12 keys. I'm it's just not going to, and, and and also if it doesn't if if I can't get to the notes on the horn if it goes too low or too high it's like what's the point? So I put in the keys that I think make sense and then I work on that and now it's it's almost I've almost got it ready where it's going to be part of my repertoire when I play some of my solos nice. and and so that's fun to me and I just try yeah, to yeah and so that's kind of how I look at my practicing I'll, I'll hopefully find something that I think is a cool pattern um, 
Maybe I'll take something from one of Ryan's solos and I'll go, okay, I love that little thing right there. And I'm going to turn, I'm going to put it in about four different keys and see if I like the way it works. And then maybe I'll use it as a pattern and maybe I'll do it up a half steps or maybe I'll go up whole steps or maybe I'll go down. I have to see how I like it's played. Or I might have to change some of the notes of the lick just to work for what I hear. So that's, uh, there's a lot of licks that I play that are my own licks, but they started with, let's say, uh, a Freddie Hubbard lick on the on the on the uh, trumpet, and it's like, oh, I love those few, first few notes, but the, after that, it didn't work for me. So I come up with a different thing, and I make a new lick out of it. And then I play the lick in a bunch of keys, and it becomes an exercise. And I play that ex exercise for twenty years, and now it becomes a, a lick that I can play forever and ever, and it actually sounds musical. You know, that's that's kind of how I do it. Kenny G PDF book out in twenty twenty five. Everybody, <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> no, you know why? Because I don't want I don't want anyone else. To that's right. They're That's yours. Right. Well, I mean, they're 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 just unique for me. You know, I wouldn't want to hear yeah. anybody just play my exact notes <laughs> that I play. So, yeah, I I say that with 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 a smile on my face. I actually would be happy to share any any licks I have. Where it's fun to me, you know, to do yeah. that. There's it's actually a, a trumpet player in Atlanta. Do you guys just do sax players only? Uh, I mean, I do piano players sometimes. There's a trumpet player named Joe Gransden. He's a really great player in Atlanta. Really great player. Uh, and he and I sometimes like I, I'll send him a lick. I go, hey, bro, check this out. And he sends <laughs> it back. Oh, man. And then I learn it and then say, That's oh, awesome. you know, I'm going to make a pattern out of that. So, um, yeah, it's killing. Cool. It's That's really awesome. fun to do. I really I love doing that. I love coming up with a pattern that's just. Like just something beautiful. And I came up with a new one the other day that I was just I love so much and it sounds so beautiful to me. So I'm just trying to get it. And um, pretty soon I'll I'll put it on my Instagram. It'll be one of my one of my things. Like I just put one out a little while ago that was a pattern I was working on for a while that I really think is cool. Yeah. Oh Love man, it. I'm excited to hear I that. Do, all I your don't in out every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All your Instagram videos are awesome, by the way. I I, I love every one of well, them. Well, they're I, you know I don't put them out very often. You know, it's like again, it's like if it is not played perfectly and exactly the sound that I want, I won't put it on my Instagram. And I, I, you know, I, I envy some of you guys that just can just whip out those soul, the, the things and they sound perfect so it's every day. But, but mine is just, I know it's, I'm just very particular about anything. It just could be just, I don't know. It could be, I don't know why, but it has to be something about it has to be played in a way that moves me. And then I can, I'll let it, let it go out. Wow. Yeah. I love, I love this amount of detail. It's really, really, really oh, awesome. Yeah. Seriously. Well, yeah. And it's, you know, and it's, it's, it's for me, for me, the, the thing that I'm working on right now, the hardest, is tonguing. And I think I've talked to Ryan about that though, when we did our Zoom, just just our chit chat. We were, and and I, mean, I think maybe Dave, we talked about it at my gig too. But just where to tongue and and where I, because I'll play some licks and I go, you know, something about it I don't like. I'm playing the notes; they're perfect. I don't, what do I like about it? So then I'll say, okay, try tonguing that note. Try tonguing that note. Try tonguing. And I have to find where I think the tonguing should be, and it's tricky for me. And that's what I work on. So I started working on that uh, seven years ago. I made a conscious effort. I said, I'm going to start working on my tonguing and I'm going to remember this date and I'm going to look back in five years and I'm going to, I bet I'm going to be better and I'm better. Seven years later, I'm, be I'm better. It's where, you know, it works. The app putting in the wow. hours works, but I have to a lot way, a, a long way still to go. And I'm, I'm working on that all the time. That's my thing when I practice is tonguing and just trying to make the licks perfect. You know, you just, Perfect. Hard ones. Lifelong Hard. student. You're never, you're never phoning it in. You're never uh, just going, ah, I've done enough. That's, it's awesome. It's like, it's, yeah. it's so inspiring. So, it's so inspiring. Yeah. Just to like, oh, you know, what, what I, what, I don't want to practice today. Kenny's practicing three hours before I woke yeah. up this morning. Come on. Let's <laughs> <That's go. true. laughs> I wake up early, but you know. <laughs> oh, no, you guys are on the East Coast time, so I can't beat that's you. Oh, uh, that's when true. I'm on the East Coast. Um, I'm, I'm done practicing by the time everybody's woken up, I'm already done. And then I do my exercise, I exercise every day too. So I, I can say, I, what I think of myself is I have a four hour job, which is like the greatest gig in the world because I like, first of all, I love to practice. So I could practice for three hours. It can be whatever, two and a half to three hours. It can be three and a half, whatever depends on the vibe. But, and then, um, I exercise for an hour and then I'll eat my breakfast. So that's kind of what I do wow. four hours from when I wake up. To when I'm now I got, but I've, but now it's like 10, 30, 11 in the morning, get the whole day to myself, do whatever I want. How are you, how, what, what kind of a great gig is that? Come on. Right. Sign me up. Yeah. From a, life, 
from a life perspective, that's like you won. Yeah. You know what I mean? I like, know. I can I, yeah. I can do whatever. I can hang with the people I want to hang with all day, or I can be by myself. I can I can just do nothing. And, drink some Starbucks. Well, I'm not, I'm not a coffee drinker. You know, <laughs> that's crazy. I'm an I'm, I'm an investor, but not a drinker. Don't worry, Man. Ryan. Ryan will drink all the Starbucks for you. Ryan, you have your own coffee line right now. I hear, right? I do. I do. Yes. And what? How is that? How did that come about? I'm curious. So, uh, well, it's a little bit inspired by how you in, in, invested into a, a coffee company, and also uh, the uh, the guy that owns Boston Sack Shop. He did his own coffee uh, line oh. at one point. So when I was when my new record came out, I was like, man, I want to try and figure out something to do that's completely different, something that no one has done like in this kind of space, right? And uh, my in-laws are really close to this um, uh, coffee roasting. They're a, a new company in Florida, like in Orlando. They live two, or their roastery is two minutes from my in-laws' house. And, it must smell uh, good around. It smells great, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so uh, I met them a couple times, and they came out to some of my gigs in Florida. And I told them about this idea. I was like, I am obsessed with coffee, and I got this new record coming out. I'm trying to do this new like promotional thing. Do you think we could partner up? And they're like, Absolutely, let's do it. So I went to their roastery and like learned a lot about how they import their coffee beans and how they roast and all their different blends and whatever. And I tried a bunch of them and we came out with one that's called Wrong Notes Only, which is awesome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and we've done a couple launch events, you know, in Florida and there's a coffee shop in Florida that now serves the beans and they have a signature drink called the Dirty Devlin, which is hilarious. Uh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dirty like Devlin's a, a great name. Yeah, it's a chai latte with the wrong notes only espresso in the latte. And wow. uh, so we call it the Dirty Devlin. And we did an event there. And so I'm like, you know, getting into the investment part of this and, and, and stuff. And I was actually going to ask you, you know, questions. Because I know you, you said you got a, an accounting degree. And, and, you know, you're kind of in, the, in you're a great businessman, obviously. So if you have any advice for me, like how you got into the Starbucks thing and then how you've invested yourself in that long term and stuff. Well, you know, we were talking finance. I mean, I love talking financially. I love it. Um, well, the Starbucks thing just happened. Um, luckily, my uncle uh, invested uh, some money with uh, Starbucks. He was like the first investor or the second or third. Wow. I uh, gave him some money and he told me, and this was just when my Duotones record came out, which is the record that has my song Songbird on it. And that record uh, took off because, um, you know, I played Songbird on The Tonight Show at Johnny with Johnny Carson. And that really hit a hit a yeah. uh, chord with uh, America and they people just went crazy for it, which was awesome for me, uh, you know. So anyway, so the record was selling millions and so it meant that money was coming in like I'd never seen before. And my uncle said, hey, I know you're making money right now. You should invest in this coffee company, uh, Starbucks. They're looking to expand. Wow. And I and I met with the guy that that ran the company and, uh, and it just seemed like the people involved were smart uh, guys. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, Sure. So I put money in. So that was kind of how I did it. And, wow. uh, and then it turned out to be obviously great because of all the work that the people that run Starbucks, all their, their work grew that company. And so, you know, I didn't really do much else except uh, I did play at some of their events when they were first starting. Like, for example, in Boston, I played at uh, the first Starbucks in Boston. Oh, no way. I think Faneuil Hall, right? Faneuil yeah, Hall? Yeah, 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 yeah. So they had an event at Faneuil Hall to announce Starbucks is coming to Boston. I don't know what year it was, 89, somewhere around there. And I performed uh, to bring awareness to the gig because nobody knew the name Starbucks, but they knew my name. So wow. I played a gig there and, and brought some awareness. And that was uh, That's uh, amazing. obviously a pleasure to do. So that was part of the promotion for it. So, they, you know, wow. little by little, things grew from that. But um yeah, listen, you're young. You 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 guys are both young. It's this is a no-brainer. All you got to do is just as you're um as you're making money with your music, you've got to put it away and let it just grow. You have to just put it away and let it grow. Don't don't spend it. Don't spend the majority of it because in if you know, money will double every 10 years. All you have to do is invest in the S&P. So mm. whatever the S&P does your money does. And the S&P goes up 10%. That means your money is going to double in, what, seven or eight years? So I just say 10. So in 20 years, your money goes four, up four times. In 30 years, it's eight times. So 30 years from now, whatever money you put in today 
is worth is going to be eight times as much. And if you keep doing that, you'll you'll by the time you're in your fifties, you will be multimillionaires. And that's not that hard to do. Right. So that, that, there's your advice. It's pretty easy. Wow. Man. That's now, it. I, I have a I have a I have yeah. an interesting question and uh this is probably a stupid question but I wanted to ask it anyway because this is a unique opportunity to ask this but when when you did that sketch for college humor like uh the one like uh, Kenny G's my imaginary best friend Oh yeah 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 which What's which that? is one of my favorite YouTube videos of all time by the way Oh it, it's hilarious uh, I quote it all the time. My dad and I quote it all the time. I quote it with Dave all the time. It's amazing. We can talk about that more later. But in the video, it says to be filmed at like your house or whatever. I don't know if yeah. that's true. But there was a Starbucks like in the home. You know what? I could use a grande latte right now. You have a Starbucks in your house? <laughs> and then I thought for the longest time that you had an actual Starbucks in your house. Is that true? Yeah. It was, it was true that it was filmed here, but we set it up to look like a Starbucks. Okay, okay. We've got a Starbucks here. Okay. I was going to say, that'd be insane. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was very funny, wasn't it? With the dueling saxes and the whole oh thing. Oh, my God. It was so hilarious. Very, Dude, very, very what, now my you're favorite line, saxophone. my favorite... Yeah, that that part. But then also when the guy like goes to play saxophone and he like makes the girl throw up or whatever, and he comes over to you and he's like, "Kenny, I just don't know what to do." And you say this line that is amazing. You go, "Bro, it's because you it suck so fucking hard." hard. And I, <laughs> when I heard that, it like, oh my god, I, I quoted that my entire undergrad to everybody. It was amazing. That's it was hilarious. amazing. Oh my god, yeah, that oh, video yeah. is so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, that was uh, you know. We were just screwing around, so <laughs> I'm glad so you enjoyed it. That makes oh, me laugh yeah. so hard, gosh. Oh, I, I can picture that day when we when we did that. It was super funny. Oh, I bet. So yeah, I'm glad you loved it. Dude, oh, I, yeah. I love all this, all the funny stuff you do. I mean, uh, your cameo on uh, Holy Moly. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. When you came out and that was the distraction. <laughs> oh, it was yeah. so good. And how about some of the Super Bowl commercials too? You've done. Oh that. man, oh, yeah. There's like, and they just like, and you have such like, you're like, it's like tongue in cheek, obviously, and you're like. I only, I forget even what, exactly what it was, but it was just like you you do so many funny things too. It's so awesome. Oh yeah, well, well, my music put them to sleep, right? So, oh, yeah. oh, was <laughs> that the prison? They were in the prison, right? Prison, yeah. And yeah. and you're just like you know you're just like killing it, and they're just like ah all relaxed. Yeah, I know, I know, you know. It's yeah, great. you gotta take care of yourself. You know, it's like Dude. people say they're going to the dentist office, and instead of Novocaine, they just put my music on and put some. <laughs> okay, oh my I god, get it. that's oh funny. My god. Um. I, I, whenever I'm like hanging out with comedians, like I remember hanging, you know, George Lopez is a very good friend of mine and we'll, oh, hang wow. out and we'll go up to somebody, we'll just be hanging out and people will come over to say hi and he'll go, Hey, you guys know Kenny G you've been in elevators. <laughs> oh my God. Ooh. But so, you know, <laughs> but you know, yeah, Hey, just... whatever, you know, fine. <laughs> fine. Hey, that's so good. Did you, okay. did you, I also uh, saw or heard something that you played like Kim Kardashian's birthday or something at their house. Yeah. What was your relationship like with with them and like Kanye West and all that stuff? Well, I never met them before, but uh, okay, I got a call. I got a call from somebody that knew somebody that said mm -hmm. Kanye wants you to come over tomorrow morning and serenade Kim for Valentine's Day. And I'm going. I don't even know them. I don't know these people. <laughs> That's crazy. And I'm not a big fan of like watching the Kardashians. I wasn't a big fan of like that kind of reality TV. I'm still not mm -hmm. a fan of that kind of reality TV. But I don't know them, so I don't judge them. But anyway, uh, a couple more people called me that night. David Foster, the producer, one of them, oh, wow. and said, "Hey, man, you should do it. You should do it." And I said, and so I thought, okay, you know, what do I have to lose, really? So I drove over. You know, this is like, you know, just cold. I don't know anybody. But I drove over. I don't. Know what, I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing, what I'm playing, or what I'm going to do. I'm just trying to. Again, I'm. I'm thinking like, okay, this is. I'm at Carnegie Hall, and whatever I do, my career depends on it. So I want to make sure this is, shit is great. Wow. So I get in there and they shuffle me into a room. And now it's like, I'm waiting for two hours and now I'm getting kind of pissed. It's like, okay, come on. If you ask me to come over, let's not. So I'm starting to get pissed. I've never met Kanye, but he comes in the room and I'm all ready to kind of go, bro, come on. You made me wait for two hours, but he's got this smile on his face. And he's got such an aura around him. That's so, so sweet. That was, I immediately love him. And it's like, we, I give him a hug. It's like, 
It's like talking to somebody that you've known your whole life. And he was so fun and nice. And wow. he tells me about what his plan is. I said, okay, great. I know exactly what to do. Show me where, show me where this is going to happen. He shows me this room. It's this big room, all marble. So the sax is going to reverb, wow. reverberate, and it's going <laughs> to sound awesome. And it's all like, there's like, I don't know, 150 roses in little glass, little vases on the floor. And I got to, I'm going to weave my way and stand right in the middle and play. <laughs> I, I got this, bro. No problem. So then a little time goes by and then it's like, okay, get in place, get in place. And now Kim is coming downstairs from whatever she's doing. She has no idea that anything is happening. And I start to play and, and it sounded beautiful in the room. So I played one of my melodies, you know, of course. And, um, uh, and, and that's how it started. It was beautiful. And so again, you know, I'm older, they're younger. So she's, she's filming it and she's posting it. And already it's like seen by tens of millions of people. Yeah. And now the phone's lighting up and now it's like, uh, James Corden wants you to come down to play a show tonight and, and do the thing you did for Kanye. And this is as I'm driving <laughs> home from the house. <laughs> and it's Jeez. Valentine's day. Yeah. Oh my God. Like, okay. I've got to change my plans. So then I, you know, I'm driving home. It's like, I turn left and I head down to CBS studio or wherever they're filming. And, and now I'm on the James Corden show. And what they want me to do is now go to the dressing room of all their guests and do this thing that I did with the roses. But now, but it's, but it's now it's obnoxious. Like they're going, Hey, why are you here? And I'm playing like, it's like, I'm giving them the Valentine's day romance. Yeah. Like, yeah. And can you just shut up? I can't hear myself. Oh. It was like, that was the whole joke that day. Oh, That's pretty funny. I hate wow. when James Gordon calls me, man, when I'm like busy uh, like that. Don't you hate I, that, Ryan? Oh, man. Yeah, when I'm <laughs> driving home, man. <laughs> hey, you know what was funny was, I'll tell you a funny one that happened that I really loved was, was um, uh, I don't know, how did I get the call from, anyway, it was the J Jimmy Kimmel show, which I like Jimmy Kimmel. And so they're, they're pretending that he's uh, going to retire and Chris Pratt is going to be on the show. Who I love, Chris Pratt, mm -hmm. and they want they want me to come down and do a sketch with him. Where I'm thinking, oh, are you what? What <laughs> me? I mean, why don't you get like Robert De Niro? You know, you don't. I'm not an actor. I don't know what the heck I'm supposed to do. But anyway, I said okay. So I go down there, and and now I'm backstage, and now Chris Pratt, who's the nicest guy, talks to me about what his what his plan is, and, and it's so funny. And so the plan is that I'm going to come out and play. Uh, a song that's going to be like a retirement for Jimmy Kimmel, but then he's going to stop me. And then I'm going to like, go, Hey man, F this. I mean, I'm here to play a song and you're not going to let me finish my, and something like that. So that skip came out really good. If you ever chance to YouTube that, that one came out great. Man. You can see what it is. Yeah. So that's, oh, those are fun things that I'm, awesome. you know, I, I, I pinched myself thinking like, you know, how did I, how did I get into this, the mix of these, of these people, but it's, and it's, you know, all, and, and at the same time, I, I get the business of it. The business is, you know, my face is seen. People remember me, my music, and it keeps my career going. So I I, I don't mind doing it. It's you know we we are in the business of music as well, not just music, right? You know, as Ryan yeah. was saying, how do you promote yourself? You know, you know, thinking about coffee and a new way of promoting your music. You got to keep doing that kind of stuff. You've got to figure out like what it is that's going to maybe catch somebody's attention, and then you can get just more more well for you now it's views for me it was always <laughs> record sales like how do you get more record sales now it's not sales it's views yeah yeah you know? or streams you know which is crazy i know yeah I, how do you how, how what's your opinion on the whole streaming thing like how do you feel about that versus like sales or you know well you know i'm old school bro you know i'm yeah, still yeah. writing down on, on paper and pencil so you know <laughs> um i think that answers that yeah you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I liked the, I liked the romance of going to the record store and, yeah. you know, talking to a person there and going, Hey, what's, what do you think I should, what's new out there? That's, Oh man, you got to hear the such and such. And then you'd go over and look at the album and you'd read the notes and you'd find out more about, cause that's the only time you could actually see a new picture of this artist. Right. You didn't, you couldn't go on YouTube and see what they did last night at the restaurant where they made a fool out of themselves, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now it's like, Oh, wow. I wonder what it sounds like. Hey, you want to hear a cut? Yeah, yeah. Put the headphones on. Oh, man, I got to buy, I got to have this one. And then and then you go home and you listen to it and there's this whole romance of music and then you camaraderie. And then, you know, people buy records. So then that's the business, you know? They would spend money on the record and the record company would take their share. I would take my share. 
and everybody's happy. Now, you know, you download it. And yeah, I mean, if you're Taylor Swift, you're going to make a lot of money on downloads because you're going to get a billion streams. But for guys like me, it's it's really pennies. And uh, I'm not complaining because I did really well in the time period where we did buy records. So no complaining. I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not looking for sympathy. But if you ask my opinion, I, I miss the old days, that part of it. It is nice to have the convenience of just downloading something when you want it. True. I like True. that. I do like yeah. it. Right. But I miss I miss just the connection. I, I don't feel like I'm I'm as connected to the artist as I was before. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, you find like, that record. Yeah, and there's no yeah. liner notes on streams. It sucks. You know, like right. a lot no like a lot of people, like especially some of my students, including myself, like, you know, there's records where I like don't know who's in the band because there's no right. liner notes. I have to go yeah. and you know, I, luckily it's an easy Google search, but still, like you, you know, you think it'd be nice to have like some kind of notes, like on Spotify or Apple Music or whatever. But you know, maybe they'll figure that out someday. But yeah, it's it's tricky. That's a tricky one. You know, it's funny. Speaking of liner notes, that's how I found my my manager that changed my career back in 1985 was George Benson. Like here's 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 what I did. So I'm I made I made three records for Clive, and none of them did very well. The second mm. one did pretty good, but the three didn't do very well. Fortunately, Clive Davis was the kind of record uh, executive that didn't just drop an artist if they didn't sell enough records for them to make money. He was invested in the artist and, and mm. they were like family to him. So uh, I was still around. And so I thought, OK, who is the biggest selling, most successful instrumentalist in the world of all time? George Benson. I went, who? All right. So who's his manager? So I found on a record, I look at it on the very bottom, you know, this guy's name is Dennis Turner. And there's his address in LA. And I live in Seattle. Got in my car, headed south, and I drove to LA. Wow. And I drove to the office. And I went up to the office and I knocked on the door. And the, <sighs> the secretary answers. And I go, hey, I don't have an appointment. I'm a sax player. I actually have a record contract. I'm looking, I want Dennis Turner to manage me. Can I, can I talk to him? So she and so she, I get to talk to him. So I talk to him and he goes, listen, I don't know anything about you. I said, well, it just so happens I'm going to play a gig at a little club in, in the Redondo beach called concerts by the sea. That's the club. Like you're talking about the lighthouse is in that same area of uh, California. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, that's the club, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The wow. lighthouse is in Hermosa beach mm -hmm. and concerts by the sea was in Redondo beach and it holds 50 people. And I had to wow. get there. I said, come, come watch me play. So he came down. To, I, I didn't think he was going to come because he's, you know, he's managing George Benson. George Benson selling three million records is what he sold on his Breezen album. He said three million records, unheard of, right? Yeah. So he, uh, I, he comes down. He watches me play. He goes, "You got yourself a manager." I said, "Fantastic." I said, "Here's the, here's the downside though. I don't have any money, so I have nothing to pay you. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that later. Don't worry about that. Right now, wow. you're opening up for George Benson. You're his opening act." So now Whoa. I, I'm playing at the Holy. Universal Amphitheater for 6,000 people. Like this happened within a couple <laughs> of weeks. 6,000 people. And I'm the wow. opening act. And, it, you know, it was I wasn't any more nervous playing in front of 6,000 people than I was. My fifth was the same thing. Carnegie Hall, top, I do my best. And I'm just concentrating on my gig and do my thing. And people seem to like it. And, and that was how I started getting from like playing little tiny clubs to big playing big concerts it happened like that luck and is when preparation meets opportunity note. that's right yeah. you know like so wow. if you if there's somebody's career that you like that's playing you know let's let's say some playing similar kind of music and you see a career that's figure figure out what the find out what they're doing find out who's helping them and what their approach is and if if they're doing well and if you if there's something that you think is can help you maybe there's part of that like I didn't know if the manager was going to work out or not, but I thought, well, I'll try that. And it turns out that his, his, he, he leveraged George Benson to help me. Hey, you want wow. George ben Benson for this? You got to take the kid along with him. Oh, they go. And, and the promoter promoters are going, sure. And you got to give him five grand a gig, <laughs> five grand a gig. Are you kidding me? At that, in those days, shit, man, i have never made money like that before. I didn't deserve it. I mean, I wasn't doing anything more than I was doing at the club for like hundreds. And all of a sudden he's getting me $5,000 a night as the opening act. And the promoters, they couldn't have cared less about that. And they were happy to give it to me. And I'm going, wow, this is pretty great. What a great manager. 
Jeez, you know? that's a that's a insane. St- that's crazy. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So that's wow. that's that's kind of how you know, if you can. But you know, you just have to. It's just and then just just be ready. Just be ready for magic moments that happen, and and then go with it and see where they say they where they take you. I mean, yeah. Wow. I mean, that's look, incredible. it's. There's no blueprint, you know. I mean, I got right. very, very lucky, and I don't say lucky because I don't deserve it. I'm just got lucky because, you know, we're we're all talented, you know. I'm not saying I'm the greatest of anything, but I was lucky that I things kind of kind of worked out the way they do. But I was talented and ready. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Dave always says the best ability is availability. <laughs> wow, I love it, man. Yeah. Dave, you got some good lines there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And then, what about what about the famous line of uh, Sna- Sam Snead? He goes, you know, the more I practice, the luckier I seem to get. Oh, that's Something a great like that, one. Right? Remember that's that a one? Great one. Oh yeah. I like oh, that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Up. It seemed to get luckier. I don't know why. Man. Yeah. Wow. But Jeez, yeah, I don't know, is... you know. I wish there was. I, I wish there was a blueprint about anything. Like, how do you write a song that's going to be like a, like the hit a hit song? I don't know. I don't know how to do it. I don't have a blueprint, you know, you just, you get lucky, you, you do what you do. And then sometimes they, sometimes they strike a chord with people and sometimes they don't. And then, and then boom, you're Kenny G. <laughs> you that's know? it. Yeah. I didn't, that's, that's I didn't write secret. song. I didn't write songbird to be a hit. I wrote songbird because that's the song I wanted to write. And that's the way I heard the notes. And that's the way I, cause I played all the instruments. I, I had a synthesizer. I played the synthesizer part. I played the bass part on the synthesizer. I played the drum part on the drum machine. Wow. I played the string parts on the synthesizer. And I played the sax part on the sax. And I mixed it. And there it Boom. is. And that's that's what that's what everybody heard. Wow. Wow. And, and I'm really out of tune on that song. I'm very sharp on that song, but that's the way I heard it. I heard it. I, I play if I play it in tune, it sounds wrong to me. It just has to be sharp. And I don't know why. I don't know why that particular song has to be that way, and it is, and it's it just sounds it sounds beautiful to me the way just the way it is, and people just loved it, you know. And I don't, I don't know why. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think I think it just I mean you're you're the reason why my parents are were married. I mean my dad played a transcription of your entire song uh, "Forever in Love," Forever and in love, yeah. uh, and my mom because they had broken up. And that was oh. my dad's, yeah, that was my dad's way of getting her back <laughs> is uh, he came to her house. Like she, I think it's, they had like a mutual breakup. Like she left to go to a different state and then came back. And my dad was like, I can't live without her. So then wow. he, he transcribed your whole thing. He sat on a stool outside of her house and on the soprano played an entire transcription of your song. And then they got like back together and then got married. Yeah. So Brian, and in their wedding know. rings, they yeah. have, they have forever in love. Wow, in, that's amazing! Yeah, you yeah. you exist because my I wrote "Forever in Love." That's correct. That's, that's the truth. Yeah. That's absolutely true, isn't it? Wow, that's a lot of responsibility, man. <laughs> hey, man, <laughs> I'm playing wrong notes call. because of you, Kenny. <laughs> well, let me apologize to the world for Ryan. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, Kenny, you know actually, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say, well, talk about transcribing your your solo on "In the Rain." Alto, of course. Yeah, it was the first uh, solo transcription I ever did. Oh my God, back yeah. in I guess early high school. Yeah, I was like, okay. I was listening. I was like, oh, he plays alto. Oh, the tone. Oh, you know, because I'm an alto. You know. Thank you. Was well, that that was beautiful on the alto, wasn't it? You know, oh, it lays it lays perfectly. Yeah. How did, uh... I can sing it to you? Da da da. And then at one part, and you go up to the high F sharp later, and it's just like, that chord right there. Yep. Then the oh, then the chorus. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, I played all this. I played all the parts on that song too. Really? Wow. Oh God. That was just all my synthesizer stuff. <laughs> oh, you're making me making me uh, blush. That was I'm 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 flattered Man. that you. Oh, you I, know, can, really, I can I sing the, the solo on too. You what? I don't play alto that much on records, and that's I'm very proud of that because I so actually good. really love the sound of my alto. So yeah. I should do Great. it more. Now I'm at my yes. to do it more. Man. Absolutely. Yeah. Gosh, do it. Oh, Man, you're so you're cool. the reason why that Dave and I are here right now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Maybe <laughs> date, yeah. I know. I, I know. I'm reasonably a <laughs> human being, but as a sax player, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. That's funny. I, and I remember when I was writing Forever in Love too. I was. I remember writing it um, on the. I started on the keyboard and I wrote the pattern on the keyboard and I just wrote it as just a beautiful little pattern. And I thought, you know, I'm going to come up with a melody that's going to go just for that. And then I worked on it and I came up with a beautiful melody, but I couldn't go anywhere with it and it just sat there for months. Wow. And I woke up one morning and went, I got it. I know where that song is going to go. And then I finished the song and the rest of the day. Yeah. Wow. Man, that's crazy. And then Ryan was born. And then Ryan. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then boom. And then Ryan was and then born. Boom. Boom, Ryan yeah. was born. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's awesome. See, that's the thing about music, though. Like, right yeah. there, just talking about it, like, something like that could be so powerful. And you're, Kenny, you're talking about, like, just talk writing songs and playing songs that you like. But right. if, it, if it speaks to you that much, chances are it's going to speak to other people as well. I mean, yeah. you know. If the right people hear it or whatever, you know. Yeah, I, I, I exactly how I think about that because I, I think of myself. I feel like I'm a normal person. I feel like I'm pretty normal. So, if I look at something and it looks good, I'm thinking most people will think it looks good. If I hear something, and it sounds good, I'm thinking most people will probably agree with me, and I'm glad that's true. I mean, I mean, it's not necessarily true for everybody, but I, I looked at it that way too. Like that's so that's why when I played all the parts on those songs. For me, it was my way of like, I'm going to make a piece of music that's only going to be made by me because anybody else is going to play. A keyboard player is never going to play the way I played on Songbird ever or on Forever in Love. They're never going to play a pattern like that because to them, it's going to sound, I don't know, too simple or too wrong or a keyboard player wouldn't play like that. And I'm going to put a drum part on there that I would play because if I give it to a drummer, they're going to put a drum and drum. It's, it's not what I want, but it's mm -hmm. what a drummer would do. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like to just in my little laboratory here, just kind of come up with my own stuff because it's going to sound different. I know it's going to sound different than anything else that anybody could do. And that's part of, I think, a way of, you know, just getting yourself away from just being one of the many. Yeah, that's so inspiring. Perfect. <laughs> wow. There's nothing yeah. to say, nothing else to yeah, add to yeah, that. Nothing else to add to that, man. That's <laughs> wow. Yeah. Man, you know, it's like when you're practicing, like when I practice, I love sometimes I don't a lot of times I don't ever I don't listen a lot. Nowadays, I just if I'm listening to for transcription stuff, it's might maybe not very often. But a lot of times I just practice. When I don't even listen to anything else. Just listen to my own sound and come up with things that I think sound good all by myself and not nothing else. No other input. Nothing. And yeah. that's how, like, even when in the studio, when I record my sax, like, well, how do I want my sax to sound? So I play it like this far from the microphone. Then I play it this far from the microphone. Then I play it this far from the microphone. Then I go across the room. But I found I found my sweet spot. I know where it is that I like to play. And it's not very, it's like, well, <laughs> this far from the sax. <laughs> and sometimes I'm playing, I, I, I ran my bell into the sax. And I mean, into the mic is like, God dang, it was so good. Now you're like, oh, got to do it again. <laughs> So wow. it's just finding your thing, finding your thing that you love. And um, it's, it's served me very well, that, that philosophy. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of everything else that's going on, but I think that a, a big reason that I have the career that I do is because I didn't pay attention to much else. And there you go. Man, when's the when's the Kenny G University coming? Like, like when are you going to yes. teach a university class or something like that, man? I, yeah, I would say, hey guys, go home and practice and shut the door and come back in a week and let me see. Let me see what you got. What should we practice? It doesn't matter. <laughs> just just get get your get that. Like I always thought, as long as that horn is in my mouth for three hours or two, whatever it is, three hours. Yeah, I'm going to be doing myself a good service because I really, I mean, I know Dave, you said you can, you can get into bad habits and I think that's true, but, but after thousands of hours, I don't think so. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, you hear that story of Sonny Rollins going to the Brooklyn bridge and practicing for two years. He wasn't listening to anybody else. Oh. What did he listen to? He was just figuring out some stuff on his horn and just, you know what? And he probably played 10 hours a day. Maybe more, yeah. maybe 12 hours a day, those guys, you know? So I look at that and go, well, okay. So <laughs> even if I'm not practicing, you know, 
the the bebop licks from the from the masters i'm practicing something and i'm playing fast and i'm working on my technique and i'm playing licks and i'm sure it's going to be probably pretty great yeah i'm thinking and so that's what i do man i don't know you know no i <laughs> i would i i i'm so happy that we're we're it, it, that you said that you would do this because i mean Every single one of my students is going to see this because I'm going to send it to them. But like, I think everybody that that's going to watch this is going to going to going to hear it from your perspective, which is so incredible. You know what I mean? To hear how you view your music and how you practice it. Like that's I mean, this is like this is information oh. that I mean, people can take and just work on forever. You know, it's like it's really, really great. Oh, thanks. Yeah, man. Well, I'm I, I'm I, I'm humble that you think that I again, I'm. You know, I don't. When I walk into a room, I don't think I'm the most special person in the room. I walk into the room wanting to be part of the the, the conversation. And if I can add, if I'm, if what I'm saying helps, I'm super super happy about that. Very much so. You know, and and I by the way, I admire both of you. Your your sax playing was amazing. You guys are amazing players. Technique amazing. Tone everything. So you know, you. I don't I don't consider myself better than anybody. Uh, well, yeah, I'm better than a lot of people. That's for sure. <laughs> like, yeah. like you guys are, you guys are better than a lot of people too. But I mean, in our company right now, let's just say our peers and you know who our peers are. Um, I'm not better. I'm just doing my thing, you know, and, but there's some guys that are play stuff that is just like some of the, some of the stuff like the, uh, the altissimo notes that some of these, these soprano players are playing these days going, holy crap how do you how can you play this and i and actually i i know one of the, there's a guy named sandro um camp 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 campion he's a french guy i see him when I, i'm in paris a lot these days so i see him over there that guy has got uh and there's an, also another guy named martin trio these are two two guys that i really like the soprano players in paris and they have technique and up there and I, and so i finally i i i got together and was like, okay guys how are you doing that? How are you doing that? Turns out that the, the 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 mouthpiece and the reed that they use has to be a certain thing for them to hit those notes so clearly. So I can't do it on my horn. Mm. But to get the tone that I want for my saxophone playing in my life, I love my setup. So I'm not going to change my setup. So I felt I feel better now. You know, I feel like okay, I my equipment is not going to let me do what they're doing. And their equipment is not going to let them do what I'm doing right. in certain ways. So it's cool. It's just like, you know, uh, vive la différence. You know, it's like, hey, let's celebrate that everybody's got got their their things that they can do that other people can't do. I think yeah. that's I think that's what we should celebrate rather than hoping that everyone can do whatever it is that the jazz police think that they should do in order to be deemed a great saxophone player. You know, yeah. like I said, I've, I heard from Miles. I heard from Jerry Mulligan said some nice things to say about my sax playing. Stan Getz, I heard, liked my sax playing. You know, come on. That's cool. Good what enough. else do you need? <laughs> yeah. Really? yeah. You know? Wow. And I've I've done gigs with Arturo Sandoval, who didn't have any complaints, you know? What what, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want now? And yeah, you've so sold you millions and millions and millions of records. <laughs> you know. That's uh that's really, really cool. I mean, I look back and go, God, I said, what a, what a time period that was when, when, when all that happened. But, you know, again, today, the, the key, I think the key to anything, the key to the whole thing is just dedicate yourself to doing the best that you can do in the way that you want to play. Just be your best. And, and the opportunities will happen. I, I have not seen the world turn its back on greatness. It can turn its back on good, pretty good, really good pretty good you know you're not, hey you're you're really good the world's there's a lot of really good out there but let's get phenomenal let's get great at whatever it is that you're doing and the world will just go okay here's the door open come right this way please and i believe that so when people say like what's the secret the secret is just get great just get great pretty good isn't going to do it Sorry. I, I feel like I can run through a wall right now. I'm ready yeah. to go to the gym. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's, Let's go. go. You yeah. got me. Hey. Up, coach. Hey, look at, look at Arnold Schwarzenegger. Watch his special. Like that guy, he was, there was some good bodybuilders out there. But there wasn't that. It wasn't Arnold. Something iron. Loved it. Yeah. Come on, man. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Did, did you watch that? Oh yeah. 
Yeah, I love that special. You know, it's like like when Arnold's talking, I'm thinking he's talking just the way that I feel, exactly the way I feel about what it's I do. Different. He's he's just like I just want to. I'm going to do whatever it takes to That's get right. to what I what I'm thinking of. He's like nothing's yeah. going to stop me. And the problem that people have with that is here's the problem: it takes year. It takes a lot of years. It might even take a couple of decades. It might. Um, and most people don't see the end result. Fortunately for me, I've, 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 okay, so I've, I've done it. So I already know it works. So now as I tackle new things in my life, let's say that I want to get really good at, I just know it's just reps and time, reps and time, reps and time. It's going to happen. It's not, mm -hmm. will it happen? Yes. Just when will it happen? Don't know. And so for young people, then when they're 19 or 20 and they want to go and play all those gigs that, that they see and they rip it on the sacks. Okay, you're probably really good, but are you great? Are you one of the greats? Are you know like say are you are you going to be like a David Sanborn or are you going to be like a Michael Brecker? Because there's a lot of really good guys out there that are ripping on that horn. So and it depends. What do you want? If you want to be there, then you know just put in those hours, and maybe another decade later you might be there. But do you have the patience? Wow. You got to have patience. I always had the patience for it because here's why. Because I love practicing and I was happy at whatever level I was at. So I'm not happy now. Well, I'm doesn't mean doesn't mean I'm not going to become great. I'm still going for it. But I'm I'm cool now. I'm not impatient. So that's that's a, that's a lot of like the, the the way it needs to be. And I I I see, you know, you know, people out there that just don't don't want to put in the time. So there you go. Blah blah blah, <laughs> blah blah blah. Way too, way too much talking. Sorry Shut about that. that. No, no, no. Man. Are you kidding me? This is like monumental well, you gotta, stuff. You better make me put this into two parts because nobody's gonna listen to two hours of my. Yes, they will. Oh, 100%. yes, they will. Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this has been amazing. I guess from yeah. from a podcast Seriously. standpoint, I guess we could wrap it up uh, <laughs> uh, here. But uh, Kenny, thank you so thank much you. for hanging with us. Thank you. This has been amazing. Such a blast. Well, we're, if you if you want another two hour part, let me know and we'll do it again. Because we can keep going. There's like so much more to talk. <laughs> oh my it's gosh! It's endless. Yeah. We, we, you know, the three of us are are after the same thing. I'm trying to become a really, really great sax player. So I'm still trying to do that. I know you guys are trying to do it. Yeah. It never ends. It just never, never ends. Well, and, and it's and how wonderful is it that we get to do this? And that's what we get to do is yeah. with our oh my boxes, gosh, play our saxophones. That's our life. Whatever in whatever capacity it is, it's like. Yeah, thank you. Oh, oh man. man, yeah, we'd love to do another episode, maybe in person someday. That would be amazing. Yeah, well, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Then you can you can show me how you do that crazy tonguing that you do. You can talk. To <laughs> I can't. Do it. I can't. Do it. I, well, yeah, we'll we'll have to we'll May, have to make something what was happen. It, May third. My my in laws already bought tickets <laughs> because okay. they they're... so I got to dedicate forever in love to your dad. Oh yeah, he'll cry yeah. like a baby. He will. Okay, I will. Yeah. I will do that. It's a really fun song for me to play. I love to play it. Yeah. Um, so I will be happy to dedicate That'd be it. That'd amazing. Oh, my God. Yeah. He will. And maybe I'll tell a little bit of the story if I can. I'll figure oh, it out. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my God. He will go crazy. Oh, my gosh. That'll be crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>